We would like to direct your attention to the emergency exits, the back door through it, and the exits at the left and right of the stage. Please put your phones on silent, but we do encourage you to share as much as possible at 23. Thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. I think we might have to wait a couple more minutes because one of our panelists has gone AWOL. <laughs> We're definitely one short. Um, so we might give a couple more minutes, if that's OK. Just give it another couple of minutes to let people come in. Thanks for coming. I think we'll we'll get started. I'm Katie Lowry, and I'm from the Creative Europe Desk Ireland Culture Office in the Arts Council, and I'm delighted to be here to introduce the Building Partnerships panel. I'm going to quote, as my colleague Aoife Tani did at our reception, Kim Cook again, where she said, it's a matter of scale and not intent, and I really think that epitomizes partnerships. And through my work in the Creative Europe desk, this is a theme I'm really passionate about and comes up again and again. And I'm really excited because I think no matter the kind of size or capacity or scale of your organized partnerships bring up, really are kind of the same. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Stay on message, people. Um, so we have Kath Gorman here who's going to chair, which is fantastic. And we have Andy from, uh, I'm just a... <laughs> Place. Curated Place, who's here with his colleague Kira, who I hope is in the room, I'm not sure, and then Jaredette from uh, Mead County Council. So I'm going to hand over to the panel, and I'm really, really excited to hear from you all, and hopefully um, some of you in the audience as well. So thanks very much. Okay. So thank you. Um, I'm <coughs> Kath Gorman from Promenade, so it's great to hear, be here this morning. Um, so we're going to kick off essentially by each of the, the different organisations, just to sort of share essentially some examples, quite diverse partnerships that they've developed in terms of their own festival making and their own festivals. Uh, so first of all, I was going to ask Ashley um, from Babaro Festival um, for Children, International Festival for Children, just to talk around, you had a number of partnerships, particularly with the University of Galway, with Moonfish Theatre and uh, Creative Europe as well, numerous Creative Europe projects. So just, yeah. To, okay. to share a little bit, and then we'll, after um, we've heard themselves, we'll go into sort of conversations, and then there'll be opportunity for a Q&A as well, questions from the audience. Cool. I'm here. Um, so. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Oh, there we are. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Arts Festival for Children. We're based here in Galway. I didn't expect it to be such a formal um, uh, presentation this morning, so uh, I'm going to kind of chat through and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll get it across okay. Um, so uh, one of our uh, longest sustaining um, part, I suppose I should tell you a little bit about Barbara first, actually, for those of you who don't know us. So we're an annual festival that takes place in October every year. 
Um, it's a curated festival of international and Irish work, of uh, dance, theatre, uh, visual art, uh, really across the spectrum, across the city and across the county. And our founding principle, uh, when our visionary founders created the festival 27 years ago now, was around um, the rights of the child and the rights of every child to enjoy a rich cultural life. Um, it was that we go back to uh, at every uh, juncture when we're trying to make decisions around uh, how we're moving forward. Um, so one of our longest kind of rather informal, at times formal, um, relationships and partnerships is with this very university. So uh, since the founding of Babaro back in, in 1996, um, I suppose the festival or the university is all over the campus for the festival to, to call home during, during the week of the festival. Um, and now we have a home here every year and we're really delighted. So it's one to have a space that we can bring children into um, during the festival. We had a significant project here that began in 2012 called Beast and it was a, a, a project with the Ryan Institute which brought together um, uh, artists and scientists over three years who were looking at, um, at uh, the proposition of a low carbon future and the county. Um, we also had a module as part of the BA in Child, Youth and Family Policy, which was around the value of the arts and the lives of children. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, the university and the department here have been associate partners in a recent Creative Europe project with Branner as well, and we co-produced together uh, Rucher, a fantastic show uh, from Branner, a really cool uh, medical device research uh, centre, again, bringing the arts and science together. Um, we've had student internships and placements, uh, which happily has been part of our team now in a new role. Um, and most recently, also, we collaborated on that LEAP project. So our collaboration with Dr. Charlotte MacGyver of, uh, of this very house um, allowed uh, Charlotte to tap into some Irish Research Council funding to follow that, that project, which was around um, inviting uh, artists from Paul level um, in terms of that connectivity in, with Sligo communities to the national and the international. So thank Thanks, you, Kath. Kath. Um, so yeah, Corrigus Sligo Arts Festival, we're a multidisciplinary arts festival um, based in Sligo, which is in the northwest of Ireland, for those of you who don't, who are not from Ireland. And um, we share our programme in buildings, on the streets, in public spaces and in outdoor locations uh, for one week each year in July. And we also run a year-round artist community engagement programs, which is really important to the ethos of the festival, which is all about celebrating diversity, inclusion, and increasing access to exceptional art for everyone. So I just want to talk to you about a, a range of partnerships. And, and as Kat said, I'm going to start locally, because for us, it was really important starting out to... Um, embed ourselves in our local community and to kind of, you know, grow strong roots there. So starting out, and we're, we're very fortunate in Sligo that we have a very strong um, arts infrastructure, um, two theatres, gallery spaces, um, there are a few arts development spaces, and we partner, we actually partner with, with all of these. So with the Hawkswell Theatre, the Model, Blue Raincoat Theatre Company, um, Hamilton Gallery, Acro Air. Um, so we've, the, the way these partnerships work, um, basically, are we are offered resources, so space, equipment, technical support, which is extremely valuable for the creation of, of, of new work and the development of work. And in return... I suppose the venues are receiving um, programme, um, community engagement, and together we're developing audiences. And the mutual interest, really, um, across all of these partnerships are developing a strong arts ecology in Sligo, um, supporting artists develop, uh, to develop and create new work, and uh, you know, enabling time and space for all of this to happen. So... Um, on to the next. As well as working with um, established arts infrastructure, we're very interested as a festival um, to uh, enable <clears throat> artistic experiences to happen in unusual spaces. So um, this, these can be outdoor, but also in unusual uh, buildings. And we're, we've just started a conversation um, with Hazelwood House, 
which is this incredible um, manor house in Sligo. It's beside Loch Gill. It's right beside a forest. And interestingly, there's a big old factory right beside the building as well. So it was unusual uh, planning back in the day. Um, so a company is recent. It's a, it's, a, it's a whiskey distillery now. And so we're discussing ways in which we can partner uh, to enable artistic work to take place there. Um, they're very interested in embedding themselves in the community. And we're very interested in bringing audiences and artists to imagine what we can do in this fantastic space. The fact that they're creating whiskey is just an aside uh, opportunity for everybody. And, and obviously a partnership we want to make work. Um, so outside of these um, place-based or building-based uh, resource uh, partnerships, because we work um, year-round uh, with, with various community uh, groups, uh, we're very interested, obviously, in developing strong community relationships. So uh, two examples of, of work that we're doing in that area, I think in 2003, there was a centre opened up in Sligo for asylum seekers, and it was very important to us to, to reach out and to meet um, new communities who have moved to Sligo and who are going to make Sligo their home. So, um, so, so in partnership with Diversity Sligo, who were a support organisation, um, and together with the Hawkswell Theatre, um, we started uh, reaching out to, to Globe House, which was the centre, um, with, with taster art workshops for people, just to say, you know, come and see what we do. Is there anything in particular that you like? That started actually in... In, in, in many ways in 2006 um, through a food art project and continued on until we started working with Broken Talkers who are a fantastic um, theatre company based in Dublin and between 2017 and 2022 um, we, we formed a, a, a group from Globe House and from the Sligo community um, to create a piece of theatre and then we went on and we made a short film. So that's just an example of how long it actually takes um, I think particularly to reach out to new communities and to develop um, a relationship with those. We're also currently working with Sligo Traveller Support Group, group and visual artist Seamus Nolan um, to explore. Currently the project we're working on is to explore representations of traveller culture in Irish history. Um, so, um, you know, partnership with Sligo Tra Traveller Support Group is crucial for us to be able to reach out to traveller communities because they obviously already have the trust and um, we already know that, you know, traveller communities are not coming to the festival. So this is the start of what I hope will be a, a many year uh, partnership in working with travellers in Sligo. So nationally, um, we partner with festivals. Um, we have strong partnerships with uh, Clonmel Junction Festival and with our partners in the Northwest Errigal Arts Festival. So together we um, co-present and we collaborate on the co-production of work. And for example, this year, Errigal Arts Festival and Corja have co-commissioned Lux. They're a landscape um, spectacle company based in Donegal to create a new coastal spectacle. And the, the remit was to make work that could work in coastal spaces in Sligo and in Donegal. And that's going to be happening across Sligo and Donegal this July. Um, together, we are a part of a, an artist development initiative with Isaacs, which is the Irish Street Art Circus Spectacle Network. And um, they're also uh, fantastic partners to work with because they're so obviously passionate about developing the street art circus spectacle um, uh, sector in Ireland. And they're so connected. So fantastic to work with Isaacs, uh, with Errigal, with Irish Aerial Dance Festival. And it's, it's a two-year platform um, for an emerging aerial artist. Um, so over the two years, the artist is working with each of those organisations and is offered time and space and expert mentors to develop their skills and eventually to develop new work. Um, on from that, uh, we have also most recently, I think many of you who were in the rowing club perhaps last night, uh, met Aoife and Mark Carey of Twisted Lane, who we are also very keen, we are, we are developing a relationship with and looking forward to working with them over many years because as you can see, they have ambitious plans. And um, so together with, um, with Twisted Lane, um, with the help of Isaacs and Promenade, which is Cat's 
organisation, uh, which is really a resource organisation and a support organisation working with artists and arts organisations to facilitate work to happen in, in kind of outdoor settings, particularly. And Kath, you can probably talk better about that. But so again, uh, Lucy and Kath are very connected internationally, and we are really only starting to work internationally, and it's something that we're really interested in doing. Um, so together with their support, we applied to the European Festival Association. It's the, Europe, the EFFEA, the European Festival Fund for Emerging Artists. And we were successful in that application. Uh, we're partnering with Passage Festival in Denmark and um, with Ural Festival in the Netherlands. And since the application, another festival has come on board. It's Inside Out Festival in Dorset. So all of these festivals are really interested in creating work on the street and in outdoor settings. Things. That is our mutual interest in supporting the work of Twisted Lane to create, um, to create work in, in a forest setting and the very initial sharings of that will be at Corja this July. I'm done. How did I do? Time wise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. I mean, already coming from both your presentation, Ashlyn's, it's this thing around partnerships that they really do take time. I think, actually, I know that's something you're going to talk about now, Andy, as well, in terms of some initial sort of seeding, how some of those projects started to then become Creative Europe projects as yeah. well. So over to yourself, Andy Thanks. Bryden, Creative Place. Thank you. Um, oh, it's lots of fonts. Never mind. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we do as Creative Place. Creative Place is a company I established in 2011. Um, been doing projects... I've been doing projects as Curate Place for a couple of years before that. Um, and so I want to speak to you not just as creative director, but also as an, an organisational owner, a business owner, um, who I'd set out to try and make a stable financial existence for artists, as well as a creative one. Because I think at any layer of the creative practice where money isn't discussed, you're not creating a strong partnership. So rule number one of creating strong partnerships is talk about the money early understand the financial position of your partners early and understand your own financial realities early. Uh, I was invited to the panel, um, at least in part, on the strength of our history of running and leading Creative Europe projects. We're just about to go into our sixth one, hopefully, if we get to sign off on that in September, which will connect uh, Ireland, Iceland and Cyprus as core partners. Um, but I'm going to show you some of our previous projects to give you an idea of how we went from me sat in a peppercorn rent office on my own, calling myself a company, to where we are now, where we're operating in 18 countries currently and running major festivals for large government organisations with large commercial clients um, and with a network of hundreds of artists and technical freelancers. One of the core things to any partnership is you need to understand your value proposition and the values that you stand by. Because if you work with people who don't share your values, you are going to have to tackle it at some point. Um, particularly for any of us that are raised and kind of nurtured by the arts infrastructure, um, there's a language and an assumed value proposition shared between all of us that does not exist in other industries. The fact that you value the work of your artists does not mean that your clients will, even though they want to buy it from you. If anything... Um, you need to get really aware of and wary of salaried people asking you to come to meetings for no money and the phrase, can you just? Because there is a massive assumption that everything that we do, everything that artists do, exists as product and there is very little value put on process um, by people that really should know better, by people that are commissioning events, by people that are leading events and holding budgets for, for major artistic interventions. Many of them, you know, we work with loads of local authorities where we'll have a, 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 a council um, cultural lead who's been doing the bins for 30 years, and they just get given a brief. So you need to educate your client at every Point. And that means you need to understand your value proposition, you need to understand how your organisation functions, not just your creative practice. This is what we've come up as our mission statement and our value proposition. So Curated Place sits at the centre of artists, place and audiences. And we activate each of them through experiences, through developing professional practice and through working with community and developing community and making opportunities. At every point where these black lines intersect, 
What we want to do is increase value for everybody we work with. So we see ourselves as a multiplier of value. So if we're getting money from the Arts Council, we want to make sure that we're bringing in commercial money to that so that we're multiplying their investment. Similarly, if we're bringing in commercial money, we want to make sure that we're getting the best artists possible that cannot be bought with money alone because their value is coming from their practice and their process. But that means at every point when we're developing professional practice, we're also developing partnerships upwards to the people that are paying us and educating them in the process that everybody we work with has to undergo. This is a fight. It's an absolute fight for people that hold the money over you and wave it at you saying that you will do creative things for us by tomorrow. And you have to say, no, we won't. It takes time. All of it takes time for you to have quality work. You can do anything with money, right? We can go, we can go and put on a major music festival tomorrow in Galway if you give us enough money. It'll be the same as every festival everywhere else. If you want a festival that's about place, you need time, you need trust, you need to nurture relationships, and you need to nurture people. So that's what we're trying to do. We're always, we sit at the center of this bridging these different worlds and making sure that we're always representing for the artists because if we undermine the artists, we have no value as producers. We undermine ourselves. Our value proposition goes down. How many people have worked with commercial agencies in any capacity, whether it's governmental or, or, or you know, business-led bottom-line profit and loss businesses? Okay, so you understand that in the arts we're getting the crumbs of a much bigger machine. If you're working in architecture, design, game development, web development, you, know, you can go and get 50 grand to design a logo and a brand pack. 50 grand in the economies we're working in are extremely low. And part of the problem is that producers, that funders and so on, expect artists and all the art workers to work for something that isn't a realistic day rate. We try to, pr pr to protect that in all of our working to make sure our partnership with artists actually ups our value. So we don't undersell the artists, but then we also up our value to say we need a realistic day rate to deliver these things. And that means we can deliver long-term relationships and we can deliver long-term development for places. Creative Europe is great for doing that because they have a very different relationship with you than Arts Council does. And Arts Council is driven by you know, in-country political decisions, distributing governmental money. Creative Europe are a different kind of organization. They're working on a European project, not a national one. They're working on a project that is connecting different countries and different values. They're, they're a value-driven organization. So we knew that our value was in multiplying the arts infrastructure. That it was in multiplying the identity of artists who connect between places. So that if you're working, I'm sure you've come across it, when you work in a place and you're very rooted to place, everybody is fighting for the same resources. Creative Europe gives you an out from that. It gives you an opportunity to work with the money between spaces. And if people don't understand what you're doing at home or if they're not ready for what you're doing at home, you can get on a 20-quid flight and go and visit someone in Europe, um, provided your passport isn't like mine. And, and, you, can go and, and you can go and work there. Um, and that's one of the things that we did. So my wife is Icelandic, so there's a lot of Nordic stuff in this. So in 2012, 13, I started working in Iceland. I met Hilma Agnesson, who was in the Sugar Cubes before Björk. He was the bass player. He's an organist, and he's a choir master, and he's absolutely impossible to manage. Um, and we, I got invited to do a project with him that was... They were working with John Taverner, who was the composer of Song for Athene that was played at um, Princess Diana's funeral. He was also the first classical composer to be signed to the Beatles label on Apple. They wanted me to help them get their work seen in the UK. Couldn't do it by supporting Taverner, massively commercially successful artist. Could do it by developing a young artist to be mentored by Taverner in Iceland. So we got Arts Council England money, we got Nordic Council of Ministers money, and we got some Icelandic money, but there's none there. So I don't have any dreams of going and working there unless you're established and know everybody in the right places. Um, but we grew that. We did one project. We took it to London. Taverner died the week we did the concert. So we went from selling 20 tickets to 900 overnight. Um, and, and that gave us a launch pad to then get Nordic cultural funding, connecting, uh, what was it, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, and the UK. And we moved composers between different organizations to do residencies with ensembles and country. The reason we did that was we're moving one person. So the partnership was affordable. We weren't moving full ensembles from country to country. It was one person going, and we had our infrastructure in-house. It gave us a format to work with. That we then grew into a Creative Europe project. So we'd learn how to work with one another, or how not to control Hilma, who would just go off and do his own damn thing anyway. 
Um, and we grew that into a Creative Europe project where we worked with the Penguins in Norway, uh, Skark Ensemble in Iceland and Hilma, and we had composers from all over Europe coming and working with people in country. And it was a really effective format. We then did that. We started doing light festivals along this time. There's loads of projects to show you, but we've not got much time. Uh, we started doing light festivals alongside it, and we took that same format, and we developed it where we would work with... <laughs> this is what happens in light festivals. It's HDMI cables knackered. Um, we started working with technological institutions in different countries, and we put this together very quickly, and this was, a, this was an error. We knew the format worked, where we'd move an individual to infrastructure instead of the infrastructure to a place to deliver because it was affordable, it was manageable. All the infrastructure was in place, the local relationships were in place. So we did it with light artists as well. We got together with the University of Manchester uh, Fondazione Mondo Digitale in Rome and oh, IO Lab in Stavanger in Norway. Didn't really know any of them. And there was two organisations there, the Manchester School of Art and Fondazione, that were much bigger than us here at Place. It was me and one other at the time. Um, so you can get Creative Europe as a lead partner on your own. It's hard, it's a nightmare to administer, but you can do it. We grew from that into two people, and then we started working with these larger organisations. The problem was we hadn't got to know each other. We hadn't got an understanding of our work process. We hadn't got an understanding of the cultural differences. Italian financial bureaucracy is another world. <laughs> like The number of signatures that you need and the number of people that go on holiday when you need that signature is unbelievable. Um, we sent a German artist to Italy as well in Rome. That was a mix. We wanted lots of order. And they're like, hey, it'll be fine. There's no money. Um, the problem was, Fondazione and the Manchester School of Art were in that situation. Everybody's salaried. They were saying, oh, can you just come and have a meeting? We could spend four days making one decision. None of my team are getting paid. None of the artists are getting paid properly. And so it led to massive conflict between people. It, it, it led to, and also when it came to cash flow, the university have this thing called a full cost multiplier where, you know, somebody that's really getting paid a 200 quid day rate when they're on single days, the university rocks in and says, oh, well, with all of our overheads, that's actually 900 quid a day. And so we're fighting a machine that was way bigger than us. So the, the, in developing partnerships, look for people that are on your scale or if you're working with somebody that's a lot bigger, you need a rock solid relationship with the individuals in that organisation. Also be wary even with the rock-solid relationship with people in the organisations, the machine can overrule them at any point. So you need to have an understanding that the, the dean of a faculty or a, a government organisation that is over an individual or you know, just a boss in a large corporate setup can always be overruled. So you need, it's much safer to develop a relationship with large organisations than jump straight in with them. Also, they can afford lawyers, you probably can't. So you've got to be aware of that. It did work. We did the project. It was really difficult. They got in KPMG to do, because Manchester School of Art wanted to do the audit. They had the finances for it in the bureaucracy of Creative Europe. They brought in KPMG. They were a nightmare as well. We had an accountant that we could have a conversation with. KPMG sent in a bunch of 21-year-old consultants who were wanting to prove themselves. Um, so you've got to be really careful about how you operate. But I understand that the... The audit things all changed a bit, so maybe we can talk about that shortly. Uh, nonetheless, undeterred, after a very difficult project, we got money for the 2018 uh, European Year of Cultural Heritage. We went back to our smaller country partners. We established relationships with artist organisations of a similar scale to us, and we implemented the same format again. Artist residencies, this time with artist residency organisations. It's actually uh, more like co-working spaces and shared buildings. Uh, and we moved artists between just northwest. Europe. So it was UK, Iceland, Denmark, Norway. This wouldn't normally work in Creative Europe because the connections between those countries are already quite tight. It doesn't add to that value proposition of the European project of connecting new places and people. Um, but in this instance, it did work because it was about European, it was a specific call for European cultural heritage. So the shared cultural heritage actually leveraged us into that fund. So you need to understand the value proposition of your funder, the value proposition of your partners and how you bring value to everybody involved in that for it to be a good partnership. So we moved people between these countries. Artists went, did field work in how places were, were connected uh, between the stories of place, and we ended up doing 
seven projects, and this kind of, the end of it kind of fell off because of COVID. So there's one project that was unfinished. One of them was Dodda Maggie, who's at the top there looking at her projection on one of the buildings in Hull. Uh, we worked with the University of Hull with an individual rather than the institution. So although we found it difficult working with the institution of a university, working with an individual academic who had access to equipment and students, uh, an ambisonic studio, uh, as it was in Hull, with this amazing room where there's like a scissor lift that takes you up into the middle of a 36-speaker configuration, and right in the middle of it, you, can, you get this 3D sound effect. Made this amazing composition, took it outside. It doesn't work because you're not in that room. Still sounded all right. Um, and we were part of a massive uh, light festival in Hull, working at scale, uh, making sure that then artist Dodda got to accelerate her career through our practice as festival makers. So again, everybody won. The value proposition was there. We protected the rights of the artists, we protected the interests of the artists. In turn, protected how we operated and allowed everybody involved in the project to go back to their funders and their local municipalities and so on and say, we are of value. Um, so where we are now is working in all of these countries where we're training for the British Council, we're in the fourth year now, uh, developing young cultural producers. We're hoping to bring, it's mainly in the Western Balkans, which if you don't know, this bit down here. Um, uh, and we're starting to bring the producers that we're training there in this kind of language of value proposition, finding good partnerships, building good partnerships, but also in the tools of how to manage a project in the same way, administratively, to make sure that that partnership, the creative partnership gives given freedom, the operational partnership is all on a level where people understand how to work together. And so all these people we're hoping to bring to Ireland in the next 12 months, uh, and we're building a community of producers internationally who we're connecting to one another so that there is a network of people, not a hierarchy, which is the way that all of organisational structures are going. Um, if you want to come and talk to us afterwards about the training we're doing, we were in the hall yesterday. Uh, we've got loads of information we can give you about how to develop uh, practice to run good partnerships. And myself or Kira can talk to you about that. And <laughs> I've killed the presentation. Uh, and we have three different kinds of courses. The reason we've moved into training more than just production is because we need that as a rock solid bed of how to work together before we get to the creative work. It, take, it creates, by, look, by concentrating on the operational structures, we can build strong partnerships because people are working in the same way. We are not distracted by how the cash flows, who's writing the report, what kind of language is used. When do you fill in a report at the end of an action? The very bureaucratic nature of Creative Europe is often quite different from a personal relationship you can have with a local arts officer. So you need systems in place to work at this level, and this then protects you to have relationships with lar larger organisations and build strong partnerships with people that are not within the arts sector. Happy to talk about this, happy to talk about money if you want to quiz us on that and how it all works later as well. And that's me. Thanks, Thanks so much, Andy. I mean, already I'm hearing loud and clear that importance of having shared vision and values in terms of the, the partners that you're, you're working with. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Gerardette Bailey, who's the Arts Officer for Meath County Council, who's going to talk a little bit around an arts co consortium of festivals that they set up in Meath County. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks, Andy. <laughs> How do I follow that now? Um, well, I'm, my name is Gerardette Bailey. I'm the County Arts Officer for Meath. And... Um, Every city and county has an arts officer now, and although we all have common objectives, we work in different ways. So there's a whole variety of partnerships and partnership models across the country. And just what I'll be talking about today is the Meath experience and the type of partnerships that we've developed um, in Meath. So like many counties, we're very fortunate to have a variety of high quality festivals taking place throughout the year. And in Mead, most of these festivals are run by teams of extremely dedicated volunteers. And so we have a range of different types of partnerships and supports with those festivals. Some are straightforward uh, funding supports through our festival uh, grant scheme, and others are individualized strategic partnerships with festivals such as Another Love Story, in, I'll just put up, see if this will work for me. There we go. Uh, such as um, Another Love Story, which is a festival that takes place in uh, Kaline Manor in Meath every August. And Meath Bio, which is a traditional music festival that takes place late spring and also in the early autumn in Slane. 
But this morning what I was going to talk about a little is to tell the story of Kells and the relationship that we have with the three festivals in Kells. So the, three, so the county's three main festivals are based in Kells and they're the Hinterland Festival of Literature and Arts, uh, Kells Type Trail, which celebrates topography as an art form, and Gukafa International Documentary Film Festival. And these festivals are core creative partners in the Kells Creative Place Making the Bigger Picture Project, which some of you may be familiar with. And the KCP project is a long-term ambitious collaborative project, which is driven by a dedicated group of artists, community volunteers and local businesses working in partnership with the local authority, um, which aims to stimulate growth through arts, heritage and culture-led regeneration. And this has been evolving in Kells for the past 10 years. So my slides today are just images because I thought it would be, it's, it's really good to give people visuals of the kind of activity that's, that's taken place. So going back to the three festivals, as our core creative partners, we work with these festivals in a variety of ways. That's funding support, strategic development, operations, admin support and programming. It's a multi-partnership, multi-layered collaboration and our relationship with each festival has evolved over a good many years, and like all good partnerships, it's evolved over tea and chats, in kitchens, in parks, in sitting rooms, in marts, in, in, you know, in gardens, in studios, in deserted warehouses, in factories, everywhere. We've met, we've talked, we've chat, we've chatted. And I see Heather from it, because she's been at most of those, you know, holding, holding the fort and keeping us all going. We've supported strategic development from an early stage. And over a three year period, we worked with Hinterland and Type Trail in particular in identifying needs and examining the various roles and the core work that these committees were carrying out. This was with the assistance of two consultants that we brought in, Ashing O'Brien and Janice McAdam, who facilitated a series with the festivals, a series of sessions with the festivals. And this was an important exercise in placing a value on the work that people were doing and by naming the work and naming it in an artistic capacity. It was also important to recognise the broad scope of the work that was being carried out and the various roles within that. And it also put words on the needs. The Kells festivals work really well together. They assist and they support each other and they're led by an extremely dedicated group of volunteers with, the commun with community development, community engagement and community connectivity at their core. And what the sessions with the consultants showed us and importantly evidenced for us was that there were common needs across the festivals. And so the idea of a festival consortium was examined as a means of clearly identifying those common needs and seeking ways of addressing them. It was very important, though, that in doing that, that each festival retained its own independence, its own um, unique identity and its own branding. So we supported the festivals in developing this and in making what was a successful application to the Arts Council under the Capacity Award Building Scheme. And this funding enabled committee members undertake a very detailed workshop and mentorship programme in areas such as strategy and planning, production, health and safety, digital marketing, volunteers and PR funding, and specifically for GAFA impact distribution. I have to say the committees and the committee members have put a huge amount of their own personal time into this and they are volunteers and everybody has another job. So a huge amount of dedication and commitment has been shown with a focus on sustainability and growth for the future. There are some tangible and some intangible results, relationship building, networking, professional development. And we now have a series of reports, which I know we all dread that word, that there's another report, but they're actually very useful to us in terms of putting things on agendas, there's a series of recommendations and visions, and it's really good for the relationship in terms of us being able to get those then embedded into programmes and embedded into policies because we have the evidence. It's important for us to note that we're only one of many partners that each of the festival have. They have a whole host of other partners, local, national and international. For example, Hinterland hosts the Hinterland West Festival in San Francisco every two years, and they programme and manage that. Um, and they also host the Litcrawl International Festival as part of the Hinterland Festival programme. Uh, Type Trail and Gokafa also have a range of partnerships with many third-level institutions and international organisations and bodies. 
Our partnerships with these festival works in both ways. As I mentioned earlier, they're core creative partners in the KCP project, and as such, they advise the Arts Office on needs, on local needs and local development strategy. And this, in turn, informs the model and the evolution of the KELS creative placemaking project. The festivals also assist the Arts Office with delivering on a number of strategies and strategic priorities from the County Arts Development Plan, and they also work with us on the ground in actually delivering programmes. So an element of KCP is the regeneration and adaptive reuse of key heritage buildings in Kells to develop an integrated network of arts and uh, cultural facilities. And one such, just for one example, one such building is Kells Courthouse, which is a beautiful uh, old building which lay dormant for many years. And we managed to get that building reopened and we've put in significant work to that building now and we have a beautiful venue upstairs. We've had some fantastic events in the new venue upstairs with the assistance of the Hinterland Volunteers, or the Hinterland Army, as we call them. Um, and we couldn't have done that without support. their support. They provide box office and front, front of house support. So it's, it's, it's a two-way stream. And Type Trail, who help with the distribution and the PR um, for each of these events. So just to finish up, um, our partnership with the Kells Festivals through the Consortium. It's evolving and it's ongoing, it's organic, and it's, it's, not, it's not set in stone. It continually changes depending on where we're at and where they want to go. But most importantly, it's based on what the festivals want and what their vision is and where they, where they would like to see themselves in five to 10 years time. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Jaredette. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that, that um, the importance of sustainability as well, that's something you're, you're already thinking about, which I think is, you know. Uh, absolutely, yes, yeah. because, um, you know, these, you know, the festivals take place, funding is always an issue, admin support, all mm. of that, and they work very, very hard. But what we need to look at is that the festivals, um, we need to be able to provide the scaffolding for the festivals in terms of they know what they want, they know where they're going, they have a vision for the future, and they know what their strengths are. And we need to recognise, um, as the Arts Office, uh, what those strengths are. And rather than creating systems whereby they have to change the focus of what they're doing to, to fit what we need, you know, in terms of admin and accountability and support, that we try, we discuss it with them and try and form a partnership where we can provide as much of that support as possible so that they can focus on what their own strengths are and that that's the nature of the partnership. It's not us coming in with, like, there is an awful lot of accountability. There is form filling. There is things to be done like that because we're, we're all accountable but that we don't make the system too onerous and that we concentrate on the strengths rather than you know, th those other areas where we might be able to provide you know, frameworks to assist. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, on an international level, say directing perhaps to Ashlyn or to Andy, is in terms of those Creative Europe partnerships, which would they, in your sense, you have built those relationships and then they go on and on over time, perhaps. They sort of, mer you know, move into something else, do you think? Is that, you know, is yeah. that in your experience? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, when we st first got involved, before my time in Bobro in 2009, in the first Creative Europe project, um, and uh, that was, I think there were maybe like eight partners at mm. that stage when Bobro got involved, and, and it was a really successful project in that unusually it was funded a number of times, and, and, and it kind of grew, and I suppose they, took a lot of the learnings from the early projects and, and, and developed those. Um, and then Babel uh, has come uh, with some of the partners and some of the structures of that, those initial projects, those small size projects, but has evolved and has brought in different partnerships as well. So there's definitely um, uh, uh, kind of learning there and uh, opportunities, I suppose, to take to take maybe the successful parts of, of, of projects that have happened in the past and kind of build on those and expand them in, in, in different directions. But it's all about, you know, it's all about shared values and relationships mm. really, mm. you know, and, and it's about like fundamentally um, as much as, as the organization and the funding and uh, ambition, all those things are important. You need to be able to get on with people and yeah. to like them. Like yeah. you're going to be spending a lot of time yeah. on Zooms, on emails, you know, 
at meetings and then all the fun stuff yeah. at festivals and everything. But like you have to, you know, it's the human condition. You have yeah, to absolutely. Because it's hard work, people. isn't it? It's hard yeah. work running these projects. So you do need to be able to, to get on. And in terms of Andy, say, I mean, in your experience, what would you say the differences are? If, look, you know, say if there's someone in this room who's looking to potentially work internationally or build international partnerships, those differences around you know, working internationally as opposed to, say, working in your own country? I, 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 there's so many. I think one of mm. the critical things is it does take time to understand cultural differences in a way where you, you, you're not even able to read between the lines when you start working in a new country. Um, when I first started working in Iceland, it's 300,000 people. Everybody knows each other. Half of those people that know each other are related. Everything works in a very different way. Um, they have a phrase, which is tetaradast. It means, you know, I'll be fine. It'll happen. It drives me nuts as like a, you know, I'm a producer. I want to be organized. I want a schedule. I want a budget. I want to know exactly what's going to happen and when. It doesn't work on that. And the first time I worked there, it drove me absolutely crazy. And I had to go through this almost breaking point going, I am not here to change Icelandic society. <laughs> is, and I am not going to, and nobody's going to listen to me. I'm the outsider in the room. So our whole business model now is based around making sure that we have a, when we, when, when we develop a large project, we make sure we have somebody in country that's able to run it. So my wife is Icelandic. She runs all the Icelandic work now. Kira, mm -hmm. who I work with in Ireland, runs the office here from um, Watford. Alison's our producer in Scotland, where I've been working for 15 years. But having a local person mm. who is on the ground building connections in the local arts ecology, that then us as a company in this distributed network are able to multiply is really important. When we get over to the Balkans and, and you know, for what they call wider Europe um, in sort of diplomatic circles, it gets even more complicated. There are people there that write blogs who are threatened with death for publicizing a film that doesn't meet moral standards. You know, it, and, and it, you come home and you kind of go, we're, we're worried about who's got the local funding and it really puts things in perspective. So you yeah. can't just, you can't enter into a territory and expect to, you can't take the same expectations with you. You need to go in with a kind of child's mentality, I think, <clears throat> to make that helpful. I, I see it as like dating. Like, you know, you go in and you, you, try a few, you try a few small things first, and then yes. you might decide to carry on with the relationship, or you might decide to run for the hills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and Tara, you were talking in, in your presentation just around that sort of value, around sort of resource sharing and mm. things like that. And, I mean, you know, when... Because sometimes with partnerships, cash doesn't always change hands you know how Quite yeah often. how are those yeah in terms of those sort of resources whether it's time time is a big thing isn't it yeah it's it's um well i think i think the kind of the the signifier of a, of a partnership that works mm -hmm. really well is you know if it, if it continues and if you're actually able to discuss the things that you felt worked really well and 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 the things that did not work so well and the things that you want to improve on and if you're an organisation who's perhaps, like you say, you know, producing, uh, working with the artists, perhaps, mm. uh, you, you know, applying for the funding, and you're working with a building who is providing you with with the space and with with the support and with the equipment. You you still and it's like Andy mentioned at the beginning of his uh, presentation, you know, talking about money, and it's it's kind of interesting because I think maybe I'm wrong, but I think Irish people, well, me, find it hard to talk about money. It's difficult, but it's really important. And then it's also really important to put a value on um, what is the value of 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 my time in in organising. What is the value of the the building that you're giving me and the heat and the lights and and actually then to have uh, to have an appreciation. Of, of what each person is putting into it and have a, mm. have a feeling, or, or that it, it should be equal, or it should feel like we're all putting in similar um, efforts yeah. um, and that we're all kind of getting back out of it what, what we want out of it. So that they're like, it is, it's not always cash, no, um, but I suppose everything can be translated as a cash value, if you want to I say. Find, I find it really useful to talk about resource rather than cash sometimes. Yeah. So the resource can be energy, it can be, it's emotional energy as well. If you, if yeah. you, if you if generally, if you've got a quality project that is creative and exploring something that's worth exploring, mm -hmm. there's an emotional investment as well. Um, but, but it has to come down to money at some point, particularly when you're working with very large organizations that have a, a, 
a different risk structure to a lot of people mm. working in the arts. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think getting comfortable talking about money and saying, you know, that the artists need to be paid properly. And yeah. like you say, the time and the risk that you take as a producer, mm. where I know that we're really good at writing funding applications. We have about 30% hit rate. Okay. That's interesting. I've never figured out the, the so percentage all, all of the rate risk, was. All of the risk, all of the <laughs> yeah. lost time in that. Yeah. That's yeah. our expertise. Mm. And it is worth money. Yeah. And, and, and mm. you know, ev everybody involved in the process then gets their value pushed up because it's what architecture's managed to do. It's what um, graphic design has managed to do through advertising, granted, mm. which maybe isn't a great thing. But all these other sectors have managed to up their value proposition in a way that fine arts elements of performing arts and music outside of the recording industry haven't. Mm -hmm. So I think talking about money is really important, getting comfortable, just saying, look, any other industry does it all day, every day. Yeah, mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I mean, obviously we have a panel here, they're very experienced, you've got long track records, you've got the weight of your organisations behind you as well. So perhaps, you know, thinking about, you know, for someone who um, doesn't have those sort of networks, they're sort of really new in terms of, figuring out how to develop those or partnerships. I was thinking in terms of local authorities, Gerardet, and the role they have in helping the arts ecology and people in terms of networks and supports around that. So it's all about connections, mm. isn't it? You know, and networking and finding out what's already out there, mm. who's doing what in that field, um, what artists are out there, what groups are out there, what organizations are out there, and widening the net. Mm. Um, the, the, the festivals we work with across Meath, um, they work in you know, the creative and the cultural sector, but they also plug into GEA is huge in Meath. They plug into the GEA, you know, they plug into the schools, they plug into lots of other organisations, you know, educational, so lots of different types of agencies as well. And they, um, they create ongoing activities throughout the year so that the festival doesn't just happen you know, at one time, then it goes away and then it comes back again, you know, like say, for example, Hinterland and Type Trail, they work, you know, they program throughout the year, they work with organisations and groups throughout the year and they're, they're capacity building by doing that, but they're also plugging in then to the expertise and the resources of those other groups as well. So what we do in the arts office is we, we have a number of new festivals that have actually started up since COVID. Um, and what we've done with them is just sat down and had a chat Told them what we can, you know, what we can provide, you know, what level they can come in at in terms of applying for funding to us, what organisations are already out there, and then we've made calls to a few organisations and groups and asked them whether we be willing to come in for a cup of tea, sit down and have a chat. Um, and what we're trying to do to establish as a policy, and it gets back to what you, you, you were saying there, Andy, about time, about people's time, is putting a value on people's time. So if we ask artists to come in and talk to organizations or to make presentations we pay the artist you know that's and that's the part that's what we're trying to do now is to get that embedded into and embedded into other departments within the local authority as well that if an artist has been asked in for a meeting to discuss something or to advise on something that they're paid like a consultant that's that's coming in yeah, absolutely. I mean, local authorities, they have a really important function in that. And I think it sort of comes through also in terms of all your sort of what you've shared today in terms of that, that local, having those local relationships and building, building from there. I um, see some of my colleagues in the room, actually. I'm not going to point anybody out, but I know that they, they all think, you know, they, you know, payment of the artists and that policy is yeah. something that's very strong on local authority agendas yeah. and it's been adopted formally by a lot, by a lot of local authorities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And obviously partnerships don't always go, go right as well. And obviously with that comes a, a, lot of, a lot of learning, you know, or sometimes they might even just start and not even go anywhere, fizz, fizzle out. Um, I don't know whether any of the panel are willing to share. You don't have to name names. Anything where, you know, perhaps it didn't quite go right or, or things that you've perhaps learnt as well that could be useful for our audience. Well, I'll just say, Andy <laughs> mentioned uh, cultural differences, and um, and this is why it's so important to to bring time to developing partnerships. And so, even so, this is within Sligo when we're working with new communities. Um, there are huge cultural differences there, and it takes um, it takes time to kind of learn um, 
learn each other's behavior, uh, learn the in-between, the <laughs> what's not spoken, and, 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 and really respect each other and respect each other's differences uh, as well as our similarities. Mm -hmm. So it's not that anything necessarily went wrong, but there, were, there, there definitely have been moments where, I mean, this is a silly example, but we were working with a group of people from Globe House and they were from different African countries and we were rehearsing and we put on lunch during the rehearsals and it was all this fabulous uh, <laughs> vegetarian and vegan food and which we thought, would, you know, this is, this is the way to, to go, of course. And, but the group were insulted, actually. They were like, where's the meat? And how come <laughs> you're expecting us to work all day rehearsing and... Uh, Where's the meat? <laughs> so we learned very quickly. We're like, okay, so don't assume that because we think this is uh, mm. whatever more environmentally friendly, etc., to offer a kind of, you know, it's, it's actually going it's back to food. Somebody mentioned food mm. yesterday and how mm. important it is. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah um, just it didn't necessarily go wrong, but it's about actually being able to learn about each other and learn about um, what's important to you as a cultural value. And, you but know, it's, it's when, when you're building something, particularly if you're working. Um, away from where you have long-standing relationships, things will go wrong. And it's being able to manage that failure that's really important. Um, yesterday, there was that phrase of, you know, rage quit versus sage quit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it felt so warm and fuzzy. It sounded like people getting fired. But um, and I think there's, there is something really important in learning how to exit a relationship well and knowing when to exit in that sage quit kind of way where you, you do have the power to walk away from relationships. We've, um, we're constantly fighting with people, right? But I think, I think when we get to a point of delivery, we spend about 80% of our time saying no because we, we need to lock down a project for it to be creatively successful for everybody. It is our job as a producer to protect the creative space at the center of any project and to stop that creative space expanding because every, every artist will come to us, when we're doing those big projections, every artist will come to us and say, oh, I need the newest projector. So, no, you don't. You need one that's good enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's, you've never even seen one of the new projectors. Or if we're working with people outside the cultural industries, they will have different measures of success. So if you're working in corporates, it's profit and loss. If you're working in tourism, it's heads in beds. If you're working in local authorities, often it's education, health and well-being impacts and so on. And, and, and that's going across the board. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be able to have those difficult conversations. And sometimes you need to be able to stand up and say, I'm an artist, I don't do that. But that doesn't mean storming out the room. It means having a conversation, saying that this is why I need to stop this. Also, never drop a project in the middle of it and just walk off, because you won't work with those people ever again. But you complete your work, and then you can exit gracefully. Mm. And that means that you can also then have more weight in the conversation moving forward. So it, it keeps coming back to time. It keeps coming back to investment. And, but fail practice. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's where we learn, isn't it? I think back to all the things that I've yeah, <laughs> mucked up. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was going to open out to the, the audience now just to see whether there's any questions. It'd be great to hear from yourselves and any thoughts or questions for the panel at all. Thank you. Uh, in terms of measures of success, um, I'm trying to kind of look at the synthesis of partnerships as opposed to the, the way they're kind of built up and broken down. And I'm, I'm interested to know, are the, is there a framework that you utilize or that you've come across where you kind of look at the softer aspects of success in combination? So for, excuse me, for example, um, you're at, because obviously sustainability is, is a big one at the moment, but it's, it's also about sustaining relationships and, and in ensuring that the likes of well-being, um, you know, the out, soft, softer outcomes, is there, are there frameworks that you've come across or, or are those things that you even consider in your uh, measurement of success as, as uh, producers of, of uh, events? I think everybody considers them. There's never enough resource to do it properly outside of academia. Um, uh, to measure those soft impacts, you need longitudinal studies over many years, and you need a baseline that doesn't shift, which in amongst the politics of arts funding, it shifts all the time. Mm -hmm. So the idea that 
artists individually and individual projects that might be running for 10 grand mm. can do that is a nonsense. And it's something that should be pushed back against. Um, the only way you can get meaningful figures out of that that isn't a useless survey put in front of people as they exit a theatre or an event mm. is by working with... It's, it's the, it has to be put back on the agencies that are trying to achieve those ends, not on the artists, for tiny amounts of money. Mm. Because, you know, what a, a, a data set to be statistically relevant needs to be over 1,000 people mm. for, a, for a country of this size or even for, for quite small populations. Um, and then it needs to be analysed by professionals not by people reading through a bunch of reports and going, oh, a few people said they liked it. It's, it's nonsense. <laughs> so, um, in answer to your question, are there any frameworks? Um, I think it is looking towards academia and saying that we... That my, my, my response to most of those asks from funders or partners would be, our, our element of evaluation is so limited for what you're trying to achieve. Let's have a look at what your measures of success are and how the bigger structures are in place to meet that so that we're not duplicating or wasting your resource. Because us doing a survey at the end of an event, to, which five people might answer, most of whom are going to be angry about it for one reason or another because they're the only ones that are going to stop, is a waste of everybody's time. Rah! <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd actually just like to add because we've started mm. so in Sligo, um, a, kind of a small consortium with Sligo Jazz uh, Project and Sligo Baroque Orchestra, um, and we've um, Anne Rakoff is here from Quality Matters, and so they've started um, a study um, with the Arts Council and festivals just to do that to measure the impact of your festival on your place. And, uh, and it's, it is difficult, I think, to probably, you know, of course we can all get numbers and, um, you know, demographics, etc. But the, the quality, like, you know, I suppose the impact of what you do on the quality of people's lives in your area. Um, so we're only at the beginning of that. And there are, I don't know anything about it, I'm just learning, but logic models. And, and we're going to be doing this in the coming years to figure out how do you measure um, that impact, and I think, um, yeah, it, it, it's uh, and, and, and it's interesting to do it across three quite different festivals. So it's a jazz festival in a school, a baroque um, festival, and ours a multidisciplinary festival. But it, it, we were talking about it and saying, actually, you know, to really measure the impact would be really interesting. And we're not going to do this because we don't have the resources to. But you know, if you were to follow somebody over a course of ten or twenty years, because I talk to people now who maybe came to an event you know, 15 years ago and the, imp and the impact it's still having actually yeah. on decisions they've made or perhaps, you know, paths they've chosen because of the existence of an arts festival or a jazz school or whatever those things are. So, um, you know, the impact can be tiny. It can actually just change your day and, mm. uh, you know, it can, in a good way or a bad way. And, uh, but so measuring them, is, it's a real kind of long-term commitment um, that takes... I think time mm. and I think effort. There's, there's that, that metric of what you're talking about that ties deeply into the idea of econ the economy being the driver of arts. And it's mm. not the small moments where somebody, we've got this weird <coughs> group, we're not weird group, they're an amazing group. We've got like a handful of curated place groupies, right? That um, have come to one event, and they might not come to many of our events, but we keep talking to them because it had one event had a profound impact on their life. Mm. But it's in a way that happened to them, not to a data set that can then be extrapolated. Yeah, yeah. Qualitative experience as opposed to the quantitative. Yeah. In a lot of these events, like what you're saying, you know, we're so profit oriented, and, mm. and actually, money is often top down, and so there's directives. And whereas, if we can put a handle on what the qualitative experience are, to some kind of measure yeah. that that allows for events to say, okay, we have a very high soft value mm -hmm. success, not necessarily huge profit success, but our soft value success has this kind of social capital, if yeah. you like, rather than... The, la the language in, in charity sector at the moment and in innovation is all shifting from these kind of uh, market-led measures that yeah. can be extrapolated, driven by social media success, driven by yeah. um, manipulating vast numbers of people, to how do the arts retain a value in the creative practice and, cre and creative practice experience mm -hmm. through human um, interaction, through uh, skills-based interaction that are about problem-solving 
and about uh, relationships That's rather than mm. rather than <laughs> Um, yeah. what is, what's threatening all of creative practice at the minute is generative AI. All generative AI can do is take what has happened before and remix it. Yes. Where our value exists in is in the future and what hasn't... The relationships that don't make computational sense sure. and emotional relationships. Sure. And so shifting the language from one of... Um, we stopped 300 people going to the doctors because we had a positive impact on their well-being. Right is it, we need to change the conversation to be one that is more about we allowed a new generation of children to operate in a society that is no longer hierarchical. It's highly networked and being manipulated from some quite dark places. Yes. And it's in the artistic... Pra our, our value proposition needs to be one that is connecting people, not connecting markets. Yeah, I think that's, that's the, the, the crux of where, like, the future... <laughs> Sorry future, the, the idea of, for, for me, what festivals are so valuable for in personal experience as well is it's really about designing these kind of regenerative patterns of relationships and, and, and how, for example, I learned something at a, a festival that I'd never experienced before. I'll go away and I'll spend time developing it if, it if it connects with me in that way. Like what you're saying, Tara, you know, you've spoken to people who have come back to you years later because they experienced something that was you know, we, we all know the, the trendy terms, transformational, but, mm. but I think that the idea is that if we have a value where we can say, you know, to actually put a qualitative measure on things, that, like what you're talking about, the relationships in terms of creative practice being a means that really puts us at the centre of our world as opposed to our profit-driven world, which is putting us at the top of a hierarchical... So, so the patterns of networks which connect, and I think festivals are really magic at providing focal points where the patterns in which we connect and the ways in which we connect are liminal mm -hmm. as opposed to... Mm -hmm. I spent a hundred euro and I came away pissed off. I'd look outside you know. the arts for what you're looking for. Something just come to mind is the EIT, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. They've just established a new thing called the Creative and Cultural Kick Knowledge Interface Community. I think that's sounds wow. cool. <laughs> um, there has been kicks for the last eight years established at a European level across health, uh, energy. Um, manufacturing materials and so on, and the kick has just been established in the last nine months. Thank you. Um, I, meet me afterwards, and I'll okay. give you the details. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Just what one more thing on, on sorry, that. Sorry, just just going back to partnerships. Um, I suppose, and it, it's not maybe directly related to to, to festivals, but I suppose at, at festival work. Um, more so in terms of, say, the LEAP Artist Development Programme that I mentioned earlier on and our yeah. partnership with the university and with Dr Charlotte MacGyver here um, allowed us to benefit from, uh, from funding that, that they were able to, uh, to, to find to follow that project. Mm -hmm. And actually, although there were only four artists who were selected as, as part of it, and it was a four-day programme, it was just a pilot, um, what came out of it was really, really rich in terms of that transformational um, effect that it had on the artists and that they felt that they were listened to, that they were valued, that in the, in the workshop that went on for four days in Galway, it was very much a cultural exchange, an artistic exchange, as opposed to Moonfish coming along saying, this is how you make theatre for children. Um, it, was, it was very much a symbiotic kind of relationship. And, and what they found the most value from was that they were, um, that they were paid, that they had time to come to Galway. They were, there were mentorship programmes afterwards, that connection um, went on. They came back to the festival. Uh, Justina is here presenting somewhere today. Uh, we're going to have one of the artists coming back to the festival in October. So although it was really small, it's been a really significant um, uh, impact on those artists' lives and that will be generative in terms of what they achieve in their communities in Ireland, which will benefit our children in Ireland. So, so sometimes it's about numbers and, you know, the, the the kick or whatever, sometimes it's a, a longer term thing, but it's, it's having the partnerships or the, the being able to tap into the resources to measure that and to measure it in a, in a robust kind of way mm -hmm. 
so that, um, and speaking of which, that LEAP report uh, is on our website at, at barbara.e if anybody wants to check it out. It's really I'll check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Jared, were you going to some of what you were saying there? That links into the ethos of creative place, you know, and that transformative effect is driven by the local festivals, by the festivals on the ground. So it's not all about the data after the festival. It's about the, you know, what they're driving throughout the year in terms of, you know, community connectivity, community pride, making a place somewhere where people want to come and live, where artists want to come and stay, and just changing the face of a town or a village because it has such a domino effect, you know, and it's driven by, by a lot of the time, by the festivals. So it's, you know, and that data is, you know, how do you collect that? You know, that's something that over years, you, you know, you look and you see how a place has changed, who's moving into that place and what the activity is on that ground. And then it is that kind of feedback from people saying, you know, they enjoy taking part in it, they want to take part in it. The volunteer numbers have gone up. And I mean, Heather's here from Hinterland. I know that that is something that's very strong with Hinterland and Type Trail that the, the sense of pride and community connectivity that has been instilled in Kells because of the festivals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kells was quite a, you know, a, how will I say it? <laughs> Historic. <laughs> Historic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where there wasn't too much activity, but it had a huge amount of potential. And it, you know, it, the, when the festival started getting up and going, it's just, it's transformed how people see where they live and how they feel about where they live. And I think that's really important, um, you know, in terms of looking at impact and, you know, what, what the impact of, of certain activities have had on an area. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, question, looking for some more questions from the audience? I just have some um, knowledge from my own experience gathering qualitative feedback. So as I've done two quantitative thesis one qualitative but the fastest way to get the qualitative feedback would be what I use in my work practice and get a feedback from parents from all the online workshops we do with them we use Mentimeter and you can get that use that on the go to the festival then pre and post festival uh, selective focus groups using psychology or occupational therapy measures I've used both um, through psychology and occupational therapy degrees and, and careers but, um, but I'd be interested and all is looking to develop new outcome measures and gather qualitative feedback in the fastest, best way to improve performance going forward. Thank you. Liz. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was great. Um, and it was so lovely to, for you to share with us. Um, there's a huge challenge in terms of there's an imperative of time with festivals you're delivering on a date. Um, and yet you need to protect the resource that is at the heart of it, which is the artist and the creativity that they bring. So just, and it's something I've been thinking about lately, just how do you manage that? And how do you manage that in a way that's reflexive, responsible and agile within the context of ye having an imperative of delivery? Um, because sometimes the work isn't ready, the artist isn't ready and things happen. And particularly as we try to diversify and expand and include more people who, um, who perhaps haven't worked within those structures and who just need more time and other sorts of resources, how do you manage that? And yeah, that's it. Um, just to understand the, the, the question, I suppose, um, how you support artists um, is yeah, it I mean, presenting and making work for, <laughs> for festivals or? No, yes, uh, but you're working within a time frame. Like you have the imperative of delivery of your mm -hmm. festival is coming and you're working with artists and providing a framework within which they produce and deliver the work. But as you try to expand the base of artists that you're working with, or whatever, whoever a particular artist might mm -hmm. be, whatever it might be that they're making, they're not always ready and flexible within that time frame. So how do you do that? How do you expand the base, support different sorts of work, support different sorts of artists making work, and yet you have the imperative of delivery? Because sometimes the temptation, I think, for people is to work with those who, with whom they're comfortable, with whom they know can deliver the work within the schedule, and because your focus is on production and output. So mm. how is that, am I, is that clear? Yeah, I think it's, I think though it's about kind of setting, it, 
realistic time frames then? Because of course there are lots of there are many artists who you develop a relationship with and you you get to know, and you know um, that they can deliver what you, you need for the festival. And and you know we take risks as festivals as well in terms of kind of programming new work. And of course we should, and work with new artists. Um, but then I think you just give um, longer time frames for developing relationships with new with new artists. And so you need to be able to to um, to give that space and time um, and and also to go okay well you know clearly you don't it's not that you want to 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 fail or or for it to not work out as you had hoped it would work out but you also need to be open to the possibility that okay what well, might not work out the way you kind of had hoped it work out and then you learn from that mm. and then when you're planning your festival next year you go oh okay well actually I need to uh, leave more time for that project to develop or you know just I think it's it's about um, I suppose there's nothing it's not really mm -hmm. rocket it's rocket science learning by from your mistakes and and but I think as well in Ireland we have really kind of um, quite short lead-in times mm. and short production they're too short and there is pressure it's not just Ireland it's not just <laughs> Ireland okay that's good to, well that's not good that's, that's bad. <laughs> But we need to be able to, to kind of change our way of working as, as much as we can, I think, yeah. just to, to be able to go, okay. And I think it's, it's, it's one of those things, again, it's, it's something that we learned in, in, during LEAP and we, were, we had some capacity building funding to, to support that when we were developing the project. And it was during the pandemic, so there's all sorts of delays anyway. But actually, one of the things that we learned was to, to take our time. Uh, even when we were developed, before we were even working with the artists to develop the call out and to, to get that right. And we had so many conversations and head scratching and, you know, um, uh, distilling, I suppose, of what it is that we want to do and being really clear about that and, um, and say, you know, recognising that, uh, that this, this project that we were undertaking, we weren't going to get everything right. We were probably going to get things wrong, and, and, and that's okay. But endeavouring to, to do it as best we can. And in fact, the process of just starting out, uh, developing uh, the team, bringing in an advisory panel, uh, the comings and goings, actually took 18 months when we planned to deliver the whole thing in like 10 or something initially. And I suppose it's one is kind of building in that time and even those artists who are coming back to the festival that we're going to be working with, we, we, we're, we're working more slowly. And it's like any of these um, uh, undertakings, I suppose, um, when you decide to do something more slowly and, and the funding needs to come to allow that as well, um, it benefits everybody. And like you say, we're all, always you know, working. There's new production. Okay, we've got five weeks, festivals happening, boom. That doesn't benefit anyone actually really it doesn't benefit the work it doesn't benefit the artists it probably doesn't benefit the festival or the audience so i think i think in um in ireland we need to we we, we need we need the the, the policy makers and the and and the festivals and the funders to understand as well that we do need that time and and i was had an interest in um conversation during the belfast children's festival where there were presentations from flanders um arts in in belgium and there were so many jaws on the ground as they talked about their their funding mm. cycles and uh, their, their 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 funding base and um, uh, you know working with three year cycles, five year cycles, mm. ten year cycles of funding where you have that expanse of time and to be able to plan and to be able to say you know to an artist we're going to go on this journey and we have this time and we'll figure it out as we go along and the richness that comes with that. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, working with our context where we're constantly writing funding applications and, and waiting for results and, and, and there's always a nervousness there because you are taking risks, but you, 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 you know, I think, I think it's, it's probably a matter of having a balance of, of having, you know, presenting work that's, that's, that's tried and tested whilst also supporting and risk taking and supporting new artists and supporting new work so that you have a, a balance to kind of present at the end of the day. I think you're describing two separate things. It's a festival in, you're describing a, a festival that has 10 years funding. It's not the same as a festival that needs to get put together in 10 weeks. No. no. They're two God. different products. It's yeah, like yeah. apples and oranges. The... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're talking about getting new voices into the arts in a safe way, in a well-managed way. It's a systemic problem. 
So a festival cannot fix it on its own. It would be specious to, to, to put that forward as a proposition. A festival, in the way that they're most normally funded, is a product. It needs the safe bet. The reason that the same people get that gig is because they've had the luxury of failure in the past. So we need to build in that luxury of failure as a separate mm -hmm. product and one that is consistent with perhaps 10 years funding instead of individual year cycles based on an annual year-end sign-off. But it's a separate project that runs alongside the festival. The festival still needs its safe attractor and the real work, but it's a window onto that real work that mm -hmm. needs to be more consistent. They get lumped into the same product and the same funding stream. And all of a sudden you hear about projects that the bottom line sounds like a lot, but the work you're describing to make that systemic shift takes investment in children, very much so, so that they feel that they have a voice and a place in the arts. That means also changing their parents' attitude towards them being involved in the arts, which can be even harder. Um, and it means then that the festivals need to have consistency to, and, and, and structure to graduate them to that level where they have failed, learnt from it, developed, built their networks, got the resilience and the personal resilience to know when things go wrong. The audience isn't going to know. The audience, you know. There's so many things you can put on a stage that aren't how you planned them. But if you do it well, no one else knows except for you. Your, your creative ego might be a bit bruised, but those that have made it, 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 I'm sure people that have worked with very established artists and those that are kind of not so established but good at what they do. So there's ones in the middle that are really difficult to work with because the ones that are really accomplished know that they can get through the difficult crunch points. And then you've got the people that I think you're talking about who have never even had a mm. shot and they're totally learning from scratch. That's the issue we need to... It's two separate projects that can feature in a festival but they're not solved by the same tools. Yeah. But I think as well, like you're talking, yeah, Andy, as well, within, within a festival programme, um, you can have a space within the programme for, for sharing of ideas and for works in progress, and then you, you actually communicate that with audiences that, mm. you know, so here's a show, it's made, it's ready to, you know, and, and here we're sharing something new with an audience, mm. and we'd love to hear what you think about it. And, and we've started doing that where last year we would have shared a work in progress um, so it's simple, there's no set, there's no, fa you know, it's, it's, it's just the basic of an idea. And then, so this year we're sharing the fully produced piece. So it's, it's having cycles like that where you can actually yeah, get people on board. But that your audience as well. Yeah. And they understand that the, the festival is a creative space, not just a, a place mm. to consume. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say also it's the supports around those emerging artists as, as yeah. well. Because yes. obviously when you're, you're trying to make it, you're, you're more likely perhaps to say yes to things as well when perhaps you should be saying no or not yet. So mm. it's, you know, what is a festival doing to help, help that? Because yeah. obviously there can be a, a power imbalance there as well in terms of the festivals there. You're there and you're going, yes, yes, when, yeah. So it's sort of looking, what, what are those sort of hand-holding things you need to do as well? Yeah, absolutely, because mm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vulnerable space, I'm mm. sure, to share your, your... Like, we're working, we're starting to work now with Twisted Lane, and this year, you know, we're starting out, it's really with a sharing of ideas, and I, and I know Aoife and Mark won't mind me saying that they're... Because Passage Festival from Denmark mm. and Oral Festival from the Netherlands and Inside Out, they're coming to Sligo to meet... Mm. Aoife and Mark to see the work and, and I know that they're feeling a bit of pressure because like, oh, you know, oh God, we have to produce like, because they're talking about their, their, their long-term vision and their long-term mm -hmm. goal, which is a large, you know, spectacle piece, but the, you know, we're, it's four years to make that work. So we're, at, we're not even at year one, actually, really, we're at the sh very sharing of ideas of what this might be. But yet I know that they feel under pressure to go, oh God, we, we have to deliver something. And so it's really about communicating. And I'm saying, no, what, what, you, what we want you to do is share, share the ideas that you have. And with that, you know, bring people on, on board and to, be, to feel confident that that's actually OK. Well, that's where the partnerships really come into their own, isn't it? Yeah. Particularly international partnerships. Because if you have somebody that's from a background that isn't involved in the arts and sees no way in, um, I didn't know my job existed when I was growing up. Um, I had no idea how to get into any of it. What was a critical dis difference was after I'd got a job in uh, a museum at a, a volunteer level, which again is a luxury, just being able to have the scope to even consider that, speak the mm. language, look right, sound right, walk right, the whole works. Um, eventually built up a bit of space and I got to leave the country. I got invited to do something in the Netherlands. 
And all of a sudden, if you get out of your bubble, you realize that everyone's making it up. <laughs> but there are so many people that are in that position that can't even get through the door that are overwhelmed by the language we create and the closed mm. courts that we create for massively commercialized now. But that story is quite interesting in seeing how do you um, nurture disenfranchised communities by amplifying their art instead of forming them into yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, yeah, it is really a fundamental um, shift that needs to happen sectorally and, and, um, and, and nationally, really, and probably in other contexts as well. But um, we are privileged uh, in, in people who can afford, particularly now, to work in the arts and to be independent artists have some kind of support network to enable them to do it. And thinking that by, you know, by deciding that, like at Barbaro, we really see that in the audiences of children who come to the festival, that they are not being fully reflected on stage in our organization, uh, on the board, um, you know, and we're very, very conscious of that. And it's something that we really want to change. But actually, until uh, the artists that we want to reach and the people that we want to invite in to celebrate their work and, and, and cultures and different voices un until they can afford to do it fundamentally. It's not really going to change. It's going to take a very long time to change. And we, um, I up until recently was chair of TYAI Theatre for Young Audiences Ireland and we did a survey of, of members late last year. And it was really shocking to hear um, how people survive or don't in the arts, actually, and the decisions that people have to make. And this is mostly Irish people or people who've been based in Ireland for a while have chosen this as a career or half a career because they actually have to waitress or do some other job to keep them going. But people deciding um, on where, where they can have, having to make choices about whether to have families, where they can live or not live, uh, because they want to have a career in the arts. So there's a really much bigger conversation around how we change the face of the arts and who's, who's represented on stage um, uh, that probably needs to, the, to happen. The greatest driver yeah. of British arts in the 70s and 80s was the doll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. you, look, you look at all of that Liverpool playoffs, Ian McEwan, Judy Dench. They, they all came out of a working class theatre in Liverpool <coughs> and they were able to get there because they had the dole. Mm. You look at all of the Manchester music scene, it was out of people going to, well, it was out of a lot of drugs as well, but it was, it, was, it was out of people going to a nightclub and not having to work in the day because they had the dole. It came out of one group of uh, council housing, mm. the Crescent, in, in the middle of Manchester. How do you fix that with politics? How do you give people the opportunity? It's, it's embracing it's the, the, the luxury of failure yeah. is the thing that keeps coming back. And policy-wise, I don't know how people at the Arts Council can fight for that with the world we're currently living in. It's a really difficult situation. Yeah. So I guess mm -hmm. it's... Uh, yeah, how do we fix that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any answers? <laughs> yeah. I think we might have to Isn't carry on in the coffee break for that discussion. But yeah, because <laughs> now I know we're sort of slightly over time. But yeah... Thank you so much to our panel for a really great conversation. Today. Can we sing happy birthday to Kath? Please. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kat. Happy
hello everybody and uh, you're welcome to the theatre. Hoshik Gilair Falcha and uh on on Auckland. Uh, I will use projection. Mummy was a speech and drama teacher, so we can we can handle this on theatre. So you're very welcome. Um, this is our penultimate session because uh, we're getting lunch after this in the uh, bar area, restaurant area, and we're going, there's another interaction or uh, intervention that's going to. Oh, sorry for the stream, Gamaleshkel, D of Galair. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yes, so my name is David Teven, and uh, I've been involved with the organising committee. And uh, one of the events that I was involved in uh, putting together was this panel. Um, I'm a recent uh, PhD uh, finisher, and it was a wonderful, wonderful journey. Um, uh, and it gave me time to focus in and look at, at, at things. But I was looking at co uh, collaborative practice in a festival context, uh, having been a festival maker myself. And it was lovely to look at that practice. Now, my I, I, I idol in terms of academically is um, uh, Bernadette Quinn here, who's, who's terribly, because Bernadette started looking at festivals as a, as a, as a in an academic context, um, a little bit before me. And uh, she's working at TU Dublin. So when we started this idea of a panel that would look at the creative act of festival making, the idea of festival making, as, or the, even the term, was something we looked at in the context of the Changemakers Conference in 2020. Um, uh, and uh, Carl and myself, when I was working with the Arts Council, developed a policy in which uh, the, 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 that, that creative act of festival making was recognised um, for the first time by the Arts Council. So um, I think that was new. And what we're trying to do in this panel is trying to interrogate that, um, that statement in the policy about festival making as a creative act. And we decided, well, I, working with Bernadette, to invite a number of people we knew as interesting practitioners, an artist, a festival maker, and um, uh, a good friend. And uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, so I'm sure Ber Bernadette will introduce you to the panel. But we also recognize that we have a room full of experts. And so we're hoping that you will join in. So without any more further ado, I'll pass you over to Bernadette. Great. Thanks so much, David, and uh, thanks for asking me to come and facilitate um, this morning. It's lovely to see so many people in the room. Um, and, uh, you know, as David said, I've been looking and thinking and being interested in festivals for quite a while now. And we're definitely seeing a shift in the amount of attention they're getting from policymakers, which is fantastic. Um, and as David said, um, you know, we've, we've got the festival policy now, which is a fairly recent intervention. And we've had the gathering before COVID, and now we've got the gathering of festival people again. And, you know, we're really beginning to, sen you know, to gain a sense that the sector is, is you know, really becoming more centre stage. And um, I, I see it as, a, as an activity, you know, that's um, becoming better appreciated, better acknowledged. I think that's terribly important. Um, but I, is it fully understood is, is a question that I think remains to be answered. And that's maybe what we're trying to do here. So, um, do, you know, David talked about this um, recognition in the policy document, which understands festivals um, as complex and special in terms of their um, in terms of their function as a creative act and also their, their specialness in terms of their curatorial role in how they develop artistic programming. And so that's what we really want to talk about this morning. And to help us dig into those complex ideas, and there's no right or wrong answers here, um, we've actually come up with three simple questions. So how we're going to structure the session is we've got three simple questions. And the first one is, what's special about festival making? Um, the second one is, um, what kind of conversations do you have 
in the making of a festival. And the third one then is how do you understand the curatorial role of festivals? So the plan is we're going to go around the panel and I'm going to introduce them now in one second and then we're going to open to the floor straight away because we're going to forget that this is a tiered, beautiful theatre theater, and we're going to imagine it's flat, non-hierarchical surface and we even have a spare chair here. And if anybody really wants to come down <laughs> at Dominic's suggestion, we're going to have you as our special guest. Um, and it's not a Graham Norton chair, it's not one of those. Um, so, without further ado, Dominic Campbell, I'm sure everybody in the, know, in the room knows Dominic, involved um, with the beginnings of St. Patrick's Festival, involved um, with um, the Altena Festival, and lots and lots and lots of other activities. We've got Lorraine May, who's the Artistic Director of Cork Midsummer Festival, and we've got um, um, Alan James Burns, who's an artist, but also an early beginning festival maker as well. Um, and we were also meant to be joined today by Harry Hughes from the Willie Clancy Summer School, but unfortunately um, he can't join us, um, unfortunately, because of illness. So that's, that's unfortunate because he was going to um, speak on behalf of um, a volunteer-run, um, long, long, long-standing festival that comes from a, um, the Trad area. But, but look, um, I'm sure there are other voices in the room um, who, can, who can contribute um, to, to, to um, give us some thoughts maybe from that voluntary capacity. So, without further ado, I'm going to ask um, our, our panellists just to speak, and I'll just start, we'll run around like this. What's special about festival making, Dominic? <laughs> so, answers on a postcard. Um, let's, let's try and answer it in a couple of ways. Can I ask, firstly, you, uh, where's your energy levels at the moment? Are you kind of like, okay, below par or above par? Show me with your hands. Middle, oh. quite high up. This, oh, that's quite buzzy. That's, good. that's pretty buzzy. Yeah. So I think that's the first thing about festival making. They are made in the moment, whatever the moment is. Uh, they are temporary. Play, they are you know, liminal spaces, as somebody said before. They are temporary moments in time. You can make them up. Every make like now should be different than the ones that I made or started to make, and the ones that I learned from. Uh, the third thing is that while they are moments in time, there is a, there is a lineage and, a, and um, a genealogy. We learn from each other. So I have, one is I'm a fine arts, I have a fine arts degree, and the other one is I have a forklift truck license. <laughs> so that limits my career options quite severely, apparently, but I didn't realise. And, and so, so I go about them with that in mind. So I am... So most of my learning is actually practical, it's hands-on, whether it was building fireworks displays, whether it was primarily building carnivals. So my biggest learning of all time, I think, is, is a carnival practitioner, uh, initially not in Kilburn, but then pro mainly in, in the Caribbean, as you know, the only white guy in the carnival camp, learning from everybody else about how they'd sustained a culture of carnival making over generations and how that had sustained, sustained the communities that made that event and how there was a place for everybody in this really simple format and the ritual of that format which kept it together and I've basically taken all of that into the work that I do I think uh, and that final thing is that I think they are they are embodied places for learning so you get to make them up differently you have to work with all the patrons and rules and regs and all the rest of it, but you do get to make them if you want. And you can make them um, utopian places. You can make them be the world that you want them to be or the world so that you go and you experience that and you take a little bit of it home and then you're better tomorrow. Um, and I think that play between what you do in these moments in time and what, what stays is about you putting your ideas in everybody else's heads. <laughs> I feel somehow deficient now after after uh, that thought. Um, yeah, I mean, I like you know a great way to start, and I agree with um, a lot of that. Um, I mean, and a lot of what we say will totally resonate with everyone here who is a festival maker. Um, for me, uh, it's that that other out of time space that a festival is. I've worked in festivals for twenty years now since I was in college. I love them, um, and that that idea that suspension, you know, in time and this this sort of space for risk both for the artists in terms of creativ you know, creatively what they want to do, and also for audiences. Um, and we've done lots of audience research in the last while, um, which has been amazing in terms of just getting a sense of what resonates with people. Um, and the top reason why people come to the festival is to discover something new, which is an amazing thing in terms of 
you know, how they see that space, how the artists can use that space. Um, there are rules, but also no rules, which is kind of what you were talking about earlier. You know, they're, they're constantly being made and remade, um, but always out of time, always sort of something new, something added, something different. Um, I think the other thing that's really special is uh, the sort of relationship with place um, and the opportunity to reimagine place. And place is so important to all of our festivals. We, we have it in our names often. You know, we have Cork very proudly up front. Um, and it's, it's really um, something that we, you know, we channel. Um, it's, you know, in terms of place, it's looking at locations that you might reimagine, site-specific, site-responsive work. Also, we do a lot of social engaged practice, participatory practice. So you're, you're working with people as well as physical space. Um, you know, geographically, we're contained within Cork, but there's a lot going on there. Um, you know, socially, politically, um, you know, it moves every year. Um, so that, that relationship, I think, is really special in terms of festivals and the place that they're in. And it's what makes every festival so unique and so different, um, no matter what size or scale they're at. Um, the other thing that I love about festivals is that, uh, in terms of that, that sort of special creative space, there's a real sense of it being no matter, again, scale, size, where it is, a pivot moment in some way in the year. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that sense of sort of forward-looking what's over the hill, what could be next, um, you know, that space for artists to sort of reimagine that, um, I think is really special and really special to be a part of. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is that um, festivals are a platform, as we know, um, and I think that that's a really special thing as well, that opportunity to bring visibility to whatever it is that you've... ...to these places. Uh, and that's also, that's really, that for me as an artist, that's an, an incredible experience to kind of work with. I kind of, uh, I had an exhibition in Carlo Art Festival last 2022, and it was about neurodiversity and climate change. But I'd done a radio interview on the piece, and I had a, during the installation on the lead up to the on the lead up to the piece, I had done an interview, and a, and a local farmer, some, in, a, local, a local elderly farmer, uh, came to kind of seek me out, and because they're dyslexic, uh, and they're spent all their lives unknown dyslexic, only kind of recently uh, heard about it, or sorry, recently found out about the dyslexia kind of just find out about the exhibition because it was in a festival, because that, that, that yeah. festival was reaching out to the community. And we had a whole hour chat, ages chat. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Four Sunday games in Forklift. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sustainable training market available. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question over there sometimes. Uh, question. Is there another, another comment? Yeah, OK, th um, thank you. Just, just to break the silence, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got involved in festivals when I was 15, just volunteering with a friend of my mum's, and it's now sort of led me to the rest of my life. And I think the main thing I noticed as a teenager working there is that um, there was a freedom of expression that I hadn't experienced before, and a freedom of creativity, and a freedom of anything is possible mm -hmm. um, and I guess I've also noticed that over the last couple of days and even hearing about like Bula Bus and the children's I never think about the children festivals I never think about you know the trad and the the town it's about the space but it's about working together with the artists that you wouldn't normally be in a theatre or in another place mm -hmm. okay thank you there's also an energy uh, that builds up with festivals and that can-do attitude that kind of comes with it that's really kind of con contagious and infectious uh, that because of the festival structure like it's like to allow people to work in different spaces and on new spaces and kind of create spectacle uh, through that kind of energy that builds up is, is, is special. Okay. Another one down the front. Thank you. Yeah, just to add to that, that idea of creating spectacle in places that we pass by every single day in a city, that then when you see it outside of the festival context, you remember it and you're just kind of left in those spaces of of making, making a place and making a city, but, but having kind of... Um, there's your vision and then there's the, you know, the, the how you get there, which obviously involves production crew and 
um, you know, everybody who like makes makes a thing and you have to involve everybody from the beginning, you know, in all of those conversations and some things that look simple might take a year, you know, like some, like we're talking about projects now that will happen in three, four years time, you know, that can be how long it takes to get people on board and the, the conversation and the dialogue is so key to that because again, you know, like we are, you were talking about this earlier, like we're not in a venue, you know, there's nothing sort of solid about it, it just kind of exists up here. Um, which sort of kind of brings me on to the next bit about conversations, which is um, a great piece of advice that I was given when I was in my 20s, which is a while ago. Uh, and uh, somebody, another director said, you know, you can't just do what you want. And I thought that was a really mm -hmm. brilliant piece of advice to get in terms of programming. I've, I've always kind of thought about that for sort of socially engaged and participatory work as well. Uh, the conversations with communities that we have. Um, so we have some projects happening in the festival this year that would have happened, we would have been talking about since, you know, sort of 2019, 2018. Um. Where our ideals is that we don't, the festival belongs to the community and it's not ours. Uh, it belongs to the different, the, the people who use it and interact with it and uh, can be inputted from everyone and kind of, like you were saying, like we want to make sure that it's, it's open for people to get in. And that's why I'm really interested in what Alan is putting together. Um, I'm only understanding myself now, my own neurodivergence. And festivals to me always meant very loud, very crowded, very sensory, overstimulating. Um, and that's just a perception I had. It's not necessarily true. And as I'm here and I'm hearing everything, I'm kind of understanding the depth of the approaches to festivals. So a possible audience is actually um, neurodivergent people or people who find sensory overwhelm or large crowds very challenging. We're site building, building side of festivals. Um, but I guess often um, people are coming forward to try and start festivals or make festivals. And it often begins as a party or you know, a group of heads getting together. And I've noticed over the years the things that seem to stop them in their tracks are getting insurance, finding space, like with landowners, policy makers not understanding pol like the policies and um, I guess, you know, obviously health and safety. But in Ireland, we seem a little bit more restricted um, than in other countries I've been to around that insurance just seems to be blanket no, event insurance have very high premiums if you're starting smaller things. Um, and just when you were saying there about that, those stakeholders, the leaders, the government people, are any of those people at this conference or in the room? Um, and then the guards as well, you know, um, they've shut down a lot of, Knock and Stockin was sort of shot, shot down by them. And um, that was a great festival for the music industry. Um, and are those people here over the last couple of days to talk about it? Sorry, I got a bit nervous. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Um, do we... Uh, did, do, do you want did, someone to speak to that? Well, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. please. Please, yeah, yeah. Lorraine. <laughs> <Please, laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's two, there's two. So you were talking about, like, stakeholders in a broader sense in terms of funders and, you know, that kind of level. Um, and then I suppose just to take the take your really good uh, question and comment first there. Um, so we're very lucky, in co I just speak to my own experience in terms of the Midsummer Festival, um, because the way that the festival has evolved, which had a lot to do with Kirkadurka and, you know, all artists led, you know, um, in terms of the mood in the city. Um, doors are more open, I feel, in Cork. And, you know, especially over the festival, people get it, they understand it. And so do the guards, you know, to, a, to a, you know, we have contacts there that understand the festival, they understand what it's about, um, that have kind of been built up over a long time, even before my time, you know, there were all these relationships that were there already. Um, but it goes back to that thing of, you know, keeping people in the conversation, you know, kind of all of the time. Um, you just can't communicate enough, you know, with those kind of stakeholders um, and with the council, um, because obviously they're working on millions of different things as well, and you know you're just one piece of it. So it's just making sure that everybody knows, um, uh, you know, what the intention is as well, and um, you know, and how you're going to do something. So I suppose I can only speak to our context in terms of your question, um, and say that we're kind of uh, 
I think we're quite lucky in that sense. Like there, I, we've done some mad things, um, and we're going to do a few mad things this year. And I probably jinx myself now by saying it'll work out. Um, but uh, there's been generally a kind of a willingness, and and they know a lot of the team, and you know they understand that we're, you know that we're quite mindful in terms of what we're doing. So I guess you know just with that practical bit, that's my experience there. So so what I what I hear you saying there is that you pay careful attention to the conversations yes. that you need to have, and you mind them, and you. You, you, you invest yeah, in, in having, you, exactly. uh, you, and you realise that you must invest, which seems a, a, good, a good lesson. Yeah. Um, Alan, I think you have something. Uh, no, I'm starting off in a festival, so <laughs> we're not, <laughs> not quite engaging uh, the Gardaí yet. But that is a very good point. Like, who, did they extended uh, organisations beyond the arts and like who, to, to have them involved? Uh, just to kind of, I can speak to speak further about like. So we're starting off actually a lot by speaking with uh, artists who identify with disabilities, uh, and they're they're shaping between them communities and uh, cultural spaces are kind of really shaping it. But there's a lot of we we also find a responsibility. Uh, so like. <clears throat> because it's you know we I don't have the right to set up a festival a disability arts festival uh, no one has but I but I I'm, I'm stepping into that role but I have a responsibility to to not to share like it's not mine it's not ours it's not the it's not the art com committees uh, and it's we're kind of given this up this we're given this we're well, semi taking semi being allowed to give it by the stakeholders but but like, through the conversations that we're having we're going slowly getting per permission to be able to put it on. Uh, with the, the community, with the, uh, funders, and so on, and that's kind of a that kind of building that uh, re respect or building that a uh, opportunity and a uh, kind of comes with those conversations. I think mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really nice way of talking about um, creative festival process as duty. So, yeah. uh, so one of the duties that I think about is how do you place care at the centre of a republic? So, so can you use a festival in order to make people more caring, in mm. essence? Yeah. And I think you can. I think mm. you, whether it's this family of festival makers and creators, mm. or whether it's a, a, a group of place which has to include yeah. authorities who have different rules and, mm. and different modes of engagement. Mm. And there's this constant kind of dance, I suppose, between you know regulation and change in regulations. When I started, when I took over Patrick's Festival, not when I started Patrick's Festival in '99, there was no regulation for outdoor events, and so there was and there was nobody to write it. So we were doing the event while writing it, while trying to figure out how to do it. And uh, that's what I like about the kind of places where it isn't fixed yet. You can start to kind of change and play about the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this ethic of care idea then that can be inculcated um, through a festival. Um, um, Lorraine, can I, can I go back to something you said a while ago yep. about the conversation with place? Yep. So can you just talk to us, what do you mean when you say that? Can you dig into that a little bit more? And, and, and is there an idea of, of, of this care idea and duty idea and responsibility idea in your mind when you're... Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Um, care is something we talk about a lot as a team um, and you know we have the written strategic plan you know uh, that that you need to kind of you know move things forward but very much through all of that is this core value of care and you know and what that means you know for us so on a micro level you know it's about the care for the team the care for what we're doing the care for each other and then it sort of extends out to a real care and respect, and respect obviously goes along with that too, um, you know, for the artists that we're working with, for the place that we're in, for the ecology that we're a part of, um, you know, that there's a sort of a sense that we're, um, that we're working alongside a lot of different things and that everything needs to be, you know, that, so care is a really important part mm -hmm. of a conversation mm -hmm. that we have a lot actually okay. we talk about it a lot okay okay so uh, and communities because we work so um closely doing uh socially engaged work and participatory practice is a very particular type of work and very, very particular type of process which is led ultimately we want them to lead you were talking about this earlier um you know it's about empowering people um you know ultimately i, I guess like it's interesting to talk about 
you know, where you are leading and where you shouldn't be leading. Actually, that's something we kind of think about as well. But ultimately, it's about, you know, enabling people to sort of tell their own stories through the festival to, to ultimately sort of create a space and then step out of it, you know, I guess. So, so what it makes me think about is that, the, so I'm doing some work with the Irish Hospice Foundation, national organisation that doesn't run hospital hospices. What it does is it brings the idea of end of life care and palliative care into the existing healthcare system. So it transforms what is primarily an acute system. It fixes, acute systems fix broken bones. Go and get your bone fixed, go home. Fantastic at that. Not so good at dying because it's built on fixing things. So if you can fix something, it's fine. When you can't fix anything, death, end of life, it goes into meltdown. And so I've got two artists in residence in acute hospitals who are in service to people at the end of life and we're now trying to work out what that means wow. having got them in there we're also we commissioned four artists to make uh health and well-being tools i suppose is the way of talking about it but we we said what what you do is fantastic for groups of 20 or 30 people who are in a room but this system this 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 village in fact this city 170,000 people with to see it's bigger than Cork City. This city has problems. Its people are in, in crisis. They've been in crisis through the pandemic. How can you fit what you do into the way that they work? So people who are time poor, who are, who are, who are under pressure in all sorts of ways, who, who, you know, your stuff is lovely, but I've got to deal with someone who's really sick. And so what we're trying to do with the hospice, or what I'm trying to do with the Hospice Foundation program, is work out what that care duty means and how it, how it's, how it's brought into an existing structure, yeah. so that maybe you can evolve that structure. Maybe that, like a tai chi, thing, you can kind of roll in a different direction. Yeah. And mm. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I, I just looked down uh, at my notes and remembered, you know, that we're talking about <laughs> the complex and special nature, and I'm about to throw it open to the floor. And um, so. Um, we're getting some thoughts here on the complex and special nature of, of festival making. Thank you. Hi there, thank you for the discussion. My name is Mark Rainey, I'm from the geography department here at the university, and I'm part of Urban Lab Galway, um, a research space. Um, I have a broad question that kind of um, links to the discussion on festivals and place. And it's how does the, you know, the temporary um, nature, the experimental nature of festivals connect to the, you know, the, all, the always there presence of place, which is, you know, the landscape, the built environment, the people and communities in it. Um, so can um, these temporary creative acts have transformative impacts, positive transformative, tra positive transformative impacts on the places and communities around them? What does that look like when they do, and how would you evaluate and kind of measure that as well? Uh, that's my question. Okay, it's uh, not an easy question. Any, any takers? <laughs> <laughs> any takers? I'll start if you want. Yeah, um, please. My favourite version of that is Theatre Theatre Gates in Southside Chicago, or uh, the the um, not not Brooklyn, it's another part of New York City, and um, Harlem Children's Project. And uh, what's their measure of success? Harlem Children's Projects is that more kids go to a, get an education. And Southside Chicago is, well, this is initial one would be that people are not trying to stab him when he walks down the streets. The place is safer. People, so there are all sorts of different ways of measuring that. Um, I, there are so many examples of place transformation. It's a complete industry. The word creative pops up on every architect's plan for their new creative penthouse suite for their so it's a it's really there's a really interesting article in the new york times about three weeks ago about the origins of the word creative and how we misuse it and um really interesting thing to unpick and look at but you've got two things you've got physical space and you've got the, you've got the soft bodies that live in the physical spaces mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It struck me that Lorraine gave an example earlier on when she spoke about the tradition from Cork Adorca and then Cork Midsummer and how Cork is this place now which is more accepting of all these crazy things. Yeah. So, so that that's that's that's. I mean, I just understood that as an example of a of a, a completely long, a, yeah a completely. Impact. Um, you know, I do, I do think that the legacy of that, you know, that that sort of um, 
that way of working and that vision for place and you know what it might mean and how you can play with it and how you can transform it and how you can change people's relationship with it. Um, you know that's definitely something that Kirkadirka really fostered in the in the city. Um, you know without a festival framework. You know mm, that's yeah. that's artists Site leading specific, that. Yeah. You know and then that sort of um, fed into the festival, you know, in terms of how that evolved. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and was, was completely transformative. And I was also thinking about um, a project that we did last year with um, teenagers and a group from Canada called M Mammalian Diving Reflex. They sort of do all these participatory projects. Um, and this project was about teenagers showing us their city. Um, and bringing us around at night and going, this is a place that, you know, one of them was showing us a place that he vomited <laughs> after, after a night out and he was like, and we're often here, you know, at whatever time rolling around and people were just like, you know, agog looking at this going, wow, that's, you know, that's amazing. But it, it, it is, it does sort of transform, you know, your, your like we got, we got a totally new vision of the city, you know, like just wandering around. So it wasn't a big site specific, you know, anything actually, it was just, yeah. You know, being led around by teenagers around the city and, you know, finding out that this is where they like to, you know, do this or that or hang out or they've always thought this about that or, yeah. you know, whatever it is, um, you know, that, that in itself, you know, you take away, you're changed, even if it's just small, you know, there's still a, still a change there. Yeah. Okay. Did you want uh, to come in, Alan? A little bit. Yeah, a uh, little bit. Okay. <clears throat> I don't, uh, I haven't made a festival yet, uh, we're in a, but as an artist, actually, so like, like that, I've, I've worked with festivals around the country, and every time I kind of work with, I, I had a little place in my heart still belongs to like certain the, the different festivals at like Carlo, yeah. uh, Skibbery, and like it, it's, it's quite special. Mm -hmm. But also, the cave based artwork that I was talking about earlier, that was created uh, first uh, in Fingal. Uh, commissioned by Fingal Arts Officer Caroline Cowley, an amazing person. Uh, but she, we, she was programmed as part of Resort Revelations, which is an arts-based uh, kind of small festival in a seaside red rural place on the north, north of Dublin. And uh, <clears throat> so every year kind of, there was residencies of artists and then there was exhibitions uh, of art works that would happen in this small community. Uh, but that kind of really transformed so my. So I, I kind of want to live there one day. Eh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but like well, I brought people out to a cave, and, so, and people still talk to, to me about that. And say that's six eight years ago now, the, the first one. But I still get messages from community local people, but also people around Dublin who's, who go to Port Ran because of that festival mm -hmm. on, a, on a monthly basis, on a, or every couple of months to go mm -hmm. out to see the cave or walk around, and, or just kind of go on as a nice place to go. But it kind of created loads of connections mm. uh, for different people in that space mm. uh, and I also brought then that resort revelations Carla and Kelly uh, developed that into discussing climate emergencies and climate change at uh, that mm. festival mm. so that kind of uh, created a big change within mm. conversations and dialogue that was happening in the area mm. uh, and I think that's one of the things that somebody was talking about how did they change place it's they propagate they, they, they seed ideas, they put things into the, they work like mycelium, they work much more in an organic way, yeah. or at least they do at the moment, um, some of them, mm. other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, really interesting. Okay, I'm going to take two more and then we, we'll push on to our curatorial. Um, yes. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe we'll take the two questions and then a response. Oh, excuse me, Shua, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so we'll take you as well, Shua. So. OK, I'm Caroline. I'm from the Adventure Tweak and Arts Festival. And um, one of the, like, about creative placemaking, I think that when you do something in a space, it sort of stays there. It's in the collective memory. So, like, we, like, last year, we animated there's a yard at the back of the courthouse. That, like, it looks terrible every time you walk past it. But now every time you walk past it, you go, oh, but that's the place where that stuff happens. Yeah. It's now a cool place. Yeah, yeah. And we do um, building illuminations that are very much about the social history of the buildings. And I know, like, the number, like, I'd say, did you see the illuminations? And everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it was really good. And I'm like, there's no way you all saw it. But they all think they saw it now. <laughs> <laughs> and you like when you walk past it, it's now a different building. It's still there in a sort of collective yeah. memory. Yeah. So it yeah. remains. Yeah, it remains, yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's a, a lovely measurement of success. Alex Pook, who now runs <coughs> the, the 
and it doesn't matter. But he said his measurement of success was that um, 200 people would buy a ticket for a show, but five years later, 6,000 people would say they were there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Siobhan Malloy. I'm from Arts Council of Northern Ireland. Um, hmm. But I would like to just comment upon the transformative effect of space and place um, with creativity and the arts from my initial um, experience in my career in the arts, which was during Flack Yolna Heron when it came okay. to the north of Ireland for the first time in 2013. So I was the liaison officer at that time, but my background is I'm a traditional musician. So first of all, for those who aren't afraid with Derry City, it is um, split first physically by a river and then um, I suppose socially, culturally and by religion. So BT48, the city side, is primarily Catholic and then Waterside is primarily PUL, what we would say. Protestant, Unionist, Loyalist. So when the flag came, there was naturally trepidation and you know a lot of questions and there was a bit of upheaval and, and so on. But ultimately, I think the, the way that space and place was utilized during that time still has had such an amazing impact on not only the people in the city, but further afield in the region and beyond. So for example, at the time, there was a new space literally made Ebrington Square and it was supposed to be an emulation of the, the city centre square of the Guildhall Square. Never used, joined by a peace bridge called the Peace Bridge. Um, and people were very, very weary of crossing over back and forth on foot to the different sides of the water. So um, during the FLA we had a gig rig in the Guildhall Square but also in Ebrington Square mm -hmm. trying to encourage that cross community element. And then as well as that, we would have had the marching band competitions for Flack Yolna Heron of the traditional Irish culture emulated with the marching band tradition of the PUL community, which as you may know in previous years would have been absolutely, that, that, that would have been out of the question to even try and bring those types of art together musically, culturally, socially, in any way. So that has really, I suppose, visibly like a good example of how you've done it on two sides of a city and it brought people together and it was like, oh, actually, you're playing the same tunes they're playing. Oh, you play that type of air, we do too. And then I suppose moving on from that, another kind of example was done again, sort of religious setting, so there is a fixed space with the different cathedrals, but we still have projects based upon that initial conversation that came from the art, from the place of Catholics going into the Protestant cathedral and vice versa, and sharing the storytelling, the language, you know, the the whole art as an overview. And then I suppose that space and place definitely trickles down beyond the arts and culture sector. It goes into education. There was all of a sudden I was teaching to muscle in primary schools as part of the curriculum all over the city. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose as well communities. We have traditional arts festival. We have a new cultus branch. It really was a great example mm -hmm. of how visibility and utilizing mm. that and sending that message of bringing the flower up north. That fantastic. really was transformative. Sounds mm. fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And over here. <laughs> yeah, OK. Thank you very much. OK, uh, my name is Suha Shakur. I am the head of Equality, Diversity, Inclusion at the Arts Council. And I was not planning to speak at all. Uh, but I have a burning question. And uh, I was hoping you all could help me answer it. Um, I hear a lot about the idea of you know, choosing one action for inclusivity and going with that and trying that out and trying a new one out each year, which I agree with to an extent. But I also see a risk there. I see a risk of all these individual acts that we undertake becoming very superficial because we undertake them, we think, okay, job done, let's move on to, to, you know, to the next thing, to, to, or to the next inclusive act we take. So the question I really have is especially for festivals because they are such changeable spaces like you've all talked about in a really beautiful way. But how do you then, or what actions have you taken in particular that you've kind of been really successful in ensuring that all these individual acts, they do all connect together. They do build a fully inclusive space rather than pockets of inclusivity here that are our festival is inclusive in this way but not this way or that way. 
So you've been around a lot longer than I have in the festival making spear since I am not a festival maker or an artist, as you all will know or may know um, about me. So I was just really curious about that longevity of inclusivity, it being such a um, Can anybody take a that one? Thing. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Give an example. Uh, in, so one of the things, uh, Patrick's Festival, I, I started that job in 99. Uh, I, one of the first things I did was start a transition year project, which is all about transition year kids, uh, exploring different types of celebrity culture, partly because uh, the, the visual metaphor for celebration is becoming very mono imagery, single picture. Yeah? It was becoming a cheap version, not understood, not informed version of Caribbean Carnival. And um, that is now 25 year old as a project. It's called Bright Futures. But what it did was it educated the staff who taught transition years, who were having no education in the schools about, I don't want to use diversity and inclusion, othering and belonging. Yeah. And um, it also talks to the, the dairy story, which is you and the, your question about you know, the guards and inclusion. You are constantly working against societal structures that work in other ways. So, so there is a way of looking at complex systems, the movement of people, um, which is uh, that they are they are they fix into patterns. They are pulled along by things, mm -hmm. and occasionally there are moments, pandemics, financial crisis, when they change. Festivals make that an annual thing. You can play with the content of it. So the long-term <coughs> tale is really interesting. And, uh, and so what I've done to encourage that is try and embed a project, as they were talking earlier, within a bigger series of relationships so that it will sustain beyond mm. the small little thing we get started. Okay. So okay. you're constantly okay. seeding. I'm going to drop in the last question, linking it into that, which is this question of the curatorial role. So if you're trying to achieve an agenda like that, I mean, where's the, the, curia, the curatorial aspect of your work? You know, you are producing um, an, ar an artistic event alongside trying to achieve other kinds of agenda and share other sorts of values. So can you talk to us um, a little, each of you, please, about how your understanding of your curatorial practice. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Again, <laughs> first year's festival. <laughs> um, so obviously we tend to think of curatorial uh, as a role for uh, curators, uh, which is, but it's also like producing is a very cu curatorial and artistic role. And they all overlap and inter intertwine. Uh, I kind of actually work largely as artist producer uh, in a lot of my projects. And then, but sorry, inter curatorially in a, festivals working with the community are already already speaking about stuff so back to the second question about who's who's involved in the conversations uh, we, we get our curatorial remit from those conversations of talking to the community we it's about platforming voices it's about creating a space a, a welcoming space an environment kind of building that energy which is a curatorial practice to kind of try and yeah. how to bring that energy together and get it across to a community that they feel not not just welcome but that they feel that they, they belong a uh, then kind of so, you know it's, it takes a lot of the so uh, in our first year's festival of disrupt we're creating a visual arts exhibition on the intersection of climate change and disability which is a topic that's building within the disability community and it's kind of the, the effects of climate change on people with disabilities and how dis people with disabilities can support climate mitigation and climate aid. Uh, it hasn't been discussed, but it is kind of, it ha it's not widely discussed, but it is rumbling within the communities. Mm -hmm. We're kind of hearing that and we're putting that, we're programming that as a, a major section of a year one's festival uh, mm -hmm. from the conversations that we're having. Uh, but it's also what, what we're, how we're doing it is we're platforming voices. We're like we're not really saying we're the artists we're working with and the communities we're working with are already kind of saying things about this. So we're trying to bring them together so that an audience and navigate the audience's experience that the different dispersed the different artworks and projects discussed can talk to each other. So it's kind of like you know you have to ask questions of when you're when someone comes how do, if even when a viewer comes how are they going to walk like what Kim was saying yesterday like how are they going to navigate the space how are they going to what's the first thing to see 
what, how are they going to interact? Uh, that kind of, I, I, we did that mentally, uh, draw it down, write it down, all that kind of sort of stuff. Uh, and then contextualizing it as well. So contextualizing the t what's been discussed in the communities and what's been discussed in the festival in a wider context a, against what's been discussed around uh, across across Ireland, the world, whichever. But like, so there is that kind of element of not just working within the community, but kind of a, curatorially contextualizing that ex externally. Okay, all right. That's a really um, interesting, wide answer to that. So a curator, a good curator, is a good listener maybe as a starting point. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, Lorraine. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that is, yes, a curator is a good, a good listener. I think it's also like the word curator is an interesting one in festivals. Like, I think if you ask lots of people, like if you were to ask the people in the room, you know, how many people see themselves as a curator? Um, you know, like how, how many people would sort of put their hands up and we do actually, Alice, do it. <laughs> how many people in the room see themselves as a curator? Festival makers as creators, yes, okay. Well, a, sc a, sm a scat, right? Yeah, so I, and I think that's fair enough. I think it's, it's one of those things that still, we're still figuring it out. You know, like what yeah. is festival curation? Yeah. You know, what is a festival curator? What do you do? What is the job? How does it relate to like visual arts curation as a, as a practice? Mm -hmm. Is it completely different? Yes, it is, you know, actually in lots of ways. Um, I think for me, in terms of that curatorial piece, it's about creating a space where creative risk can happen. Um, so that, you know, it doesn't just happen on its own. It needs to be sort of minded and, uh, you know, sort of this, I'm, I'm kind of doing this because it feels like a bubble almost, you know, that you're, that you're sort of creating for people in which they feel that they can take a risk. Um, and also that they're supported in terms of that risk that they want to take. And again, this is, these are things that we're like, we're not getting a gold star on any of the things I'm going to mention. You know, these are all works in progress, things that, you know, that, that we're working on. Um, but this idea that there's, you know, that they, they can take a risk, that if the intention that they had, that it doesn't work out exactly as imagined, that that's okay, that there's still value in that. Um, a lot of value and that you will still progress and move on and something will change and, and good things will happen, you know, from the, the act of taking that risk. Um, and I think it's the same for audiences. Um, you know, I think in terms of audiences, it's about creating a framework around what the artists are making um, in which audiences can interact, you know, so that they understand what it is that, and this is something that we're learning more and more, you know, from our audiences telling us, you know, in terms of how we present the festival, um, you know, that they want to know, I guess, you know, why something is there, how it relates to other things that are they're in the program, um, how it's all kind of pieced together so that they understand the context and they can come at it in a certain way and, um, you know, relate to it in a certain way. Um, I think uh, it's part of our jobs to be like, a kind of a lightning rod or like a, to know, you know, what's, what's in the air, to be really curious and, you know, to sort of have, like we've talked a lot about conversations, but to have all those conversations, um, to sort of have a sense of what's happening. You were talking about this kind of everywhere, you know, like just not just in one place, but how it relates contextually to other things. Um, you know, so for us, that's kind of locally. Um, it's also nationally and also um, internationally as well. Um, you know, like, like where, do we, where do we sort of fit within that? And the conversations that artists are having um, or the, the things that they're saying and telling us, you know, like how they relate to other things as well. And to really bring uh, a relevance to the festival too, because we were talking a lot earlier about, you know, that sort of forward thinking, forward momentum that festivals bring, that pivot point. Um, you know, wh like what is that? What are the, the kind of conditions that need that to happen? And also, you know, what are the types of things that people want to engage in or be involved with um, and how we create conditions for those to flourish and for people to lead. Um, the other job, I think, in festivals, too, is uh, this, uh, this idea of the edit. You know, like you have to edit, you can't include everything. Um, and one of the, the trickiest bits, I think, in that is how you edit while still remaining inclusive. So you want as many people as possible to come to your festival, but you can't program everything. Um, so what does that look like? What does, you know, an, an inclusive space where people feel like they're represented, which I also think is a, is a curatorial job too, 
It's um, to, for us primarily we're looking at the city. Are we representative of the city? Um, we're not, by the way, at the moment. You know, like these are again all kind of works in, in progress, but I think they're things that we need to think about. Um, and, and how we create a sense of belonging, um, which is something that we're thinking about an awful lot more and we were talking about earlier as well. Sense of belonging within the festival um, while still having this edit done on, on what's in it. Um, I think those are really important things too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Dominic? The question again. So the question is, so we're talking about the curatorial role. Yeah, okay, yeah. No, the curatorial okay. role. Sorry, so, you know, listening, seeing what's out there locally, artistically, and then to community-wise, the needs, and then um, negotiating and navigating and deciding a pathway um, to, 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 to lead. Yeah, I do love a good tangent. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I... No. <laughs> so the first thing is to always say yes. Yes, we'll make a version of that. I think that's a kind of radical act. The second act is, a, second thing is about gifting, understanding the power of a gift. And then the third thing is that we make decisions. And the decisions are the kind of where the spirit meets the bug with the practical stuff. And then we decide to sit there in the awkward space. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and hope. So, so, so I think people that approach festivals as, as creative minds are, are mavericks primarily. They've got lots of different skills for driving and driving. But they have lots of, they, 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 they tend to not make a hierarchy of their skill set. They treat all their skill sets as, as equal but different. Um, the second thing is, as you've already talked about, momentum. So you make a welcome and, and a space in which you can say, yes, we'll make a version of some version of it. But uh, by extending that welcome, you build momentum. Um, and then you try and cling on for dear life and, uh, you know, talk about it afterwards. Um, it was, there was something else, but it's gone, so... Open to the floor. Okay, so, so we've got lots of hands sh shooting up. The, I think here was, yeah, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that panel. It was really insightful. I've enjoyed every minute. Um, my name is Karen Kelly. I'm from Maynooth University. And we've just um, come out the other side of our second ever <coughs> Arts and Minds Festival. Oh, yeah. um, it, w it went down really well. Lots of learnings, for sure, t as we embrace 2024. But it strikes me from listening to the panel and, and uh, the various people in the audience as well, is that <coughs> festival making um, as a community act it is also a very powerful message that's coming across to me here. Um, and something that I would have considered, I suppose, because I am part curator, part project manager, part everything with regard to this festival. But, you know, and I suppose it's consideration too of the fact that Maynooth University inhabits an academic space, but also um, has a piece for festival goers, for the community, for arts and culture. So we've encouraged um, our local community and wider in the hinterland as well to get curious about <coughs> culture and mm. embrace the university not just for the academic space it's in mm. but for what it can Open you know up. provide back to the community yeah. and, and give them that, that sense of belonging and pride mm. so that's kind of our i suppose vision if you like okay. of our festival journey or thinking at the moment yeah. so uh, maybe in 10 years time i might have a different answer to you in terms of where we've gone but yeah. um, thank Lovely. you for everything today okay thank you there was one here. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks very much to the panel. Um, my name is Rona McGrath. I'm the Arts Officer in Roscommon County Council, but also have been involved and I'm involved with a voluntary hat um, over many, many years in different events and festivals. Um, and my um, comment, funny enough, it touches on that previous comment, is about the voice of the volunteer and so many festivals who are here um, yesterday and today um, are all completely voluntary. Um, the committee, the creators, the creators and the curators of the festival are voluntary and they, so it's about kind of um, the expectations that a voluntary committee can create a, a festival that's so hugely important to the community, to the area, um, that is high, high class, you know, brings in, uh, engages respectfully and creatively with, with the artists, with the, the performers. Um, 
but that you know they can't work all year round on uh, that a, in the way that a professional um, organisation could do. So it's about the expectations of what can be delivered without burning out that committee. Mm -hmm. And also where that committee can reach to maybe for the professional expertise, as mm -hmm. Gerardette was saying pre mm -hmm. in the previous session, you know, the arts office can mm -hmm. potentially, uh, mm -hmm. and other organisations, yeah. yeah. you know, provide yeah. parts of that. For yeah. example, in Roscommon, we commission um, music. Uh, so we can do that. We can engage with the composers uh, and deliver that commission process mm -hmm. and for it to take place then mm -hmm. during, say, mm -hmm. Boyle Arts Festival is, is mm -hmm. one example. Mm -hmm. But so it really, my, my, I wanted to just touch on that voluntary aspect mm -hmm. and role. Yeah, and no, I think that's a very important point that you make and to acknowledge that effort and to recognise the conversations that need to be ha happening to support all of that activity. Now... It's also a lovely note about why is it important for those people that they do this thing? Mm. So the true yeah, value big of it con. in people's yeah. lives. Yeah. yeah, I think it's about the community where it's mm. yeah. at the yeah. heart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I always find it really interesting as well. Uh, like if you look at, we've obviously... Um, it just who, it just gives your name? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm Fikr Davern. Um, I, I work with Elu Le Gras. It's a, a festival starting in Galway in, in three weeks' time. Okay. And um, the, I always find it really interesting just the historical um, the background to having festivals. Like if we go way back to when we were in the caves and things like that, um, we would have always had these gatherings, like these coming together at historical seasons. And mm. um, you know, then like when we moved to being farmer cultures, when when we were bringing in yeah. the harvest, or like in the depth of winter, and yeah. or to celebrate the coming of spring, or to celebrate, uh, you know, the, the height of summer. And I think that it's, uh, I think sometimes it's it's very important that like we actually need these festivals as people to like come together mm. to share ideas, and mm. um, sometimes to fix problems like. And I think that that is uh, something that kind of sometimes gets a little bit lost in maybe in some of the festivals uh, where they're a little bit, if they're kind of too big or whatever. But I think that that's really important to people to have yeah. that space that they can uh, come yeah. together and yeah. like uh, yeah. build and propagate uh, yeah. new ways of thinking. Yeah. Um, especially in, in mm. a, you know, maybe yeah. when we're doing some things these days that aren't yeah. maybe beneficial for everyone. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. You're, I mean, festivals have been found absolutely everywhere over time. Um, I'm not sure how much time pressure we're under. We've got one minute, one absolutely. minute. I saw a hand shoot up there, um, the cream top. The one. Yeah. And, and then we might, um, well, let's see how we get on here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, no we move, we're flexible, we move in the moment. Um, Thank you for such a great panel. My name is Amato and I'm doing EDI work for K-Fest in Kilorglen. And okay. um, but my own background would have been in student activism, um, especially in the field in UCC. Don't um, say you have forked license. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was um, I, I was involved in a student society called Fall to Refugees for okay. three years and finished up as chairperson of that society. And I think some of my experiences in that really speak to to two of the questions today. So we would have run our own mini festival on campus called um, Refugee Week over five days. And as when I was in the chairperson role, I suppose in a way I was also the curator right, of that event. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone with me was students from 18 to 23 mm -hmm. years of age. Mm -hmm. And I think the three things, looking back on it all now, that I would really ask myself with a group of volunteers trying to create something impactful but with very little resources or time, mm -hmm. is one, who do I have? and not projecting who I wish I had onto them, but who do I really have, mm -hmm. and see, see people in their fullness, yeah. and give them the love that they deserve for just having shown up. Mm -hmm. No matter what skill set they have, huge or not, they are here. So who do I have? Why are they here? And when you really ask that question, that's what unifies us all. Like We were all there because we saw something in our community and in our society that we felt wasn't working right, and that's our treatment of migrant, migrants and refugees in Ireland. So. Even if we all had different skill sets, we were all there for a very unified reason, and that gives you huge momentum and power to move forward. And thirdly, um, what do they love? What do each of these people love in their lives as individuals? Rather than me as chairperson trying to have a grand vision that I then struggle to, to, to put into practice, actually asking everyone, what do, what do you love? What are you passionate about? What niche interests might you have? and going from there, because as volunteers, that's really all you can do. And by allowing everybody to, to select one thing that they were really passionate about and saying, okay, let's make it work, 
then me as chairperson or as a curator, it's your job to, to tie those things together. It's your job to find the thread that makes that a unified um, event and, and thing over a week. So that would be the third question. The second question we were talking about then was um, who's in the conversation? And for us, um, the society started, I guess, four to five years ago now, and it had moved from like a charity to a political and activism society. And in the first year of the committee, you know, we all looked around and we were all, some of us were maybe mixed backgrounds, but most of us were Irish without a migrant background. We were like, Jesus, like, should we be here at all, you know? But we all agreed that the whole purpose of this society, for however long it continued, would be that one day we'd be able to to hand that over and step back, and that one day it would be a fully refugee and migrant-led society. And by just showing up and being true to who we were and our values and putting that out every year, I have seen that, even though I'm no longer involved, that the first year there was one refugee, the second year there were three, the third year it's almost 50-50, you know, of people of colour and our students. And so, yeah, if you're true to your, to your vision and your values, opening up that space and having more people in the conversation will just happen naturally. So, I think that's a wonderful that's really um, <laughs> ending <laughs> conclusion <laughs> to our panel, which, which only leaves me to thank you very, very much indeed for coming with us and engaging with us and to thank our wonderful panel, really, really, really wonderful panel for sharing such interesting and insightful and profound um, expertise and knowledge. So thank you very much thank indeed. You. Um, thank you. Carl. Sorry, I just yeah. have one housekeeping note. And Bernadette, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing so yeah. eloquently. Just to say the next session is next door in the uh, Bank of, uh, in the Bank of Ireland. Um, thank you. The next session is in the Bank of Ireland. Oh, it's okay, I'll be fine without it. Uh, it's next door in the uh, Bank of Ireland. It's in the student coffee bar. So actually, you can, uh, sandwiches are there for you, and the session will continue as you're eating. And we encourage you to eat and exchange ideas and keep talking. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.